afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. Fade to black. What's up? What's up? What's up? Woo. All right. All ready to go. Pumped up. Got the new music going. It's Wednesday. The lights are dark. Had a few days off. And the wife had me put in a new sidewalk in the backyard. (laughs) That was... That was my time off. My body is still paying for it. Welcome, everybody. Here we go. Everybody listening around the world. Today is Wednesday, May 14th, 129 days into the new year. This is Fade to Black, live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in roasting hot Burbank, California. For KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, that's the new intro. Let me know what you think. That's Space Boy. Thank you, Space Boy. It's pretty cool. It's long. It it just keeps going. We can we can just run this mix for about five minutes. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, salute to all the proud men and women in uniform all around the world fighting the good fight for us. Without them, there is no me. There is no you. There is no us. And you couldn't hear me right now. Think about it. Really need you to think about it. All right. Oh, so good to be back. Such an honor to be speaking to all of you all around the United States, all around the world. Uh, Netherlands, Finland, Holland, Denmark, Belgium, London, UK, Ireland, Australia. Probably got some China going on tonight, some Japan, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico. Can't forget the uh, Great White North, Canada. Just, it's amazing the growth. And again, I'm just humbled and honored. Welcome everybody. All right, let's go. Let's get it cracking. That's cracking. Number one, uh, Twitter's already going. If you want to tweet to us, you know what to do at J church radio and do me a favor. Hashtag DM radio net. So you can clog up Keith's Twitter box. Just clog it up. And uh, do at Jack, too. Jack Dorsey. Just tweeted him, by the way. Said, Jack, you you need to come in and listen to the show tonight. A couple of weird things um, before I get to. Oh, you know what? Let's just let's just cut to uh, the chase. Let me let me indulge myself today. Director George Lucas is 70 years old. 70 years old tomorrow on tomorrow's show. We're going to have Dan Fogler in here and. Dan is, uh, you know, comedian, director, actor, and you remember him from the movie uh, Balls of Fury. <laughs> that was an amazing flick. And also the movie Fanboy. And if you remember, or Fanboys, in, in, in that movie, there are a bunch of Star Wars geeks, and they go to the motherland. You know, they go up to uh, 
to uh, Skywalker Ranch and uh, and go and visit George Lucas. <laughs> so tomorrow night, Dan Fogler in the house. He's got a new movie out called Don Peyote. We'll be talking about that tomorrow night, live from New York. And I got to tell you, Dan is, is out of his mind, and it's going to be a great, great show. Talk to him today. Uh, also today, bassist Jack Bruce. Jack Bruce, 71 years old. Wow. And also Bobby Darren. Bobby Darren, born in 1936, died in 1973 at the age of 37. Had the hits, smacked the knife, and splish, splash, and my favorite, Beyond the Sea. Uh, Mac the Knife won a Grammy in uh, 1960, but he died at 37 years old. Bobby Darren. Wow. Crazy. Good stuff, though. All right. Twitter, at J Church Radio. Email. Got a couple of emails that already came in a couple of minutes before the show. I'm going to read uh, both of those in just a second. And head over and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I don't know what's going on with YouTube, but we added, like, 500 subscribers in three days. No, no joke. Go over to YouTube and look at that. We're up to like 1,500 subscribers. But uh, that's that's the that's the place to be if uh, you miss the show tonight or you don't catch the repeats on Dark Matter. If you want to wait a week, you can go and check everything out. We get it up on Saturday. Uh, tonight, I don't know if we're going to have We'll We'll have open lines later. Uh, we'll get the interview out of the way, uh, with Marshall, uh, Klarfeld. If he wants to take some calls, we'll take some calls and, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, the, the call in number is always is three, two, three, eight, two, five, 50, 45. And if you want to Skype in, you can do that too. Uh, fade to black 14. And, uh, if you haven't headed over to jimmychurchradio.com today, there's a new look on the website, so you can go check that out. I think it's cool. I dig it. And uh, so go check it out. So I think it's uh, it's pretty pleasing on the eyes. Okie dokie. What are we going to do now? Email jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. And all of the most of the stuff on the website is, is still in the same spot, but now we have a links page. So we've taken, we've removed some of the links from the front and created a links page in the back for all of our guests and anything else that we think is important. So the links have been moved, uh, and you can go check that out. All right, got a couple of emails I want to get to really quick. And uh, first one, uh, did you hear, did you know that there have been two documentaries done on HARP? Besides the one on History Channel, there was also one done by CBC, Canadian Broadcasting. And here's the link, and we'll put the link up on the website. Although you and your guest have spoken briefly on Harp, I think that Fade to Black listeners, well, actually, uh, F2B, F2B, can, can you say that, F2B, instead of Fade to Black? Everybody does it when they're writing, but can you say it right? Does it sound right, F2B? I don't know. Fade to Black listeners would be interested to hear an entire show on the subject. So would I, actually. Maybe one of the two concerned researchers listed in the first section of the page above under HARP, what is it, would be available to talk about their research. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally into HARP. And if you think about it, one of the things that uh, uh, earthquakes and the, the accusations about Fukushima or Chile or not only the atmosphere above, but also as as above, so below. And those are the concerns with heart for me. And I definitely, I you know, I'm with you. I, I think that's a, a weather control device, weapon, if you will. All right, another email. Jimmy, several times you have mentioned your extensive links to the music industry and musicians. Recently, I heard Grant Cameron talking about the fact that certain well-known musicians came out with songs containing lyrics given to them by ETs during abductions. He mentioned the Moody Blues. I think, and maybe other musicians also. I have listened to UFO stories for many years, but this story was totally new. With all of your connections, have you heard about or been told about such interactions? From Ben Miller. 
And yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and if you think about it, we had uh, we had Graham Bonnet on, who well, he wasn't abducted, but he had that uh, that sighting out in front of his house in Topanga, and he was willing to come on the show and talk about it, and that was pretty interesting. And also his paranormal experience with the man in the room that he wrote a song about and about James Dean. And I have, yes, I do have friends out there that uh, I would like to have them come on the show. Oh, we had Jeff Cullen on not too long ago, and he told about his experience when he was in England. So, yeah, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Let's get to the church rant. All right, church rant. Head over to jimmychurchradio.com. Check out the new the, the, the look of the new site. And uh, I think everybody's going to dig it. But uh, go down. It's, uh, you know, it's cleaned up. I like it. I think it's great. So anyway, easy on the eyes, easy to read. But go down to the church rant. Church rant is in the same spot as it always is. And this is the deal. This is the deal. Go down to church rant. There's three photographs there. You can see they're all blue. And some of you may have seen this story that we broke a couple of days ago, and we chose to do it on Facebook early instead of waiting for the show. Now, tonight on the show, I'm going to talk about this. This is the coast of Malibu. Now, I'm going to give credit where credit is due right now. Got an email last week from a listener, Marshall. And he sent me picture number one on the left. That's the coast of Malibu. And, oh, I'm sorry, he sent me picture number two, the one in the middle, the one in the middle. And you can click on either one of those. But that's the coast of Malibu. And he said, you know, Jimmy, there's something weird going on here. I think this is an underground base. What do you think? And so... I got my guys on it, and we started to check it out. Now, this is this is the situation. If you go to picture number three, well, let me set this up correctly. So picture number two in the middle, open that up, take a look at it. You see that round section. And if you look directly above it, you see Point Magoo State Park. That, that whole section of Malibu is a Marine Corps Naval Air Station. Okay? It's called Point Magoo. I don't know how many Marines and Navy or maybe even some Air Force is there, but it's a pretty advanced uh, military installation. That's what's right behind it, and everything that you see in front of it, you see that flat space. This was all done in our investigation with uh, Dale Romero. And uh, Billy Rizzo sent in some information, too, as well. So I want to thank Marshall and, and Dale. and it's, it's Marshall, Romero, and Rizzo. It sounds like a detective agency, and they've done a really good job. So look at the formation that is there, that round setup. Now, right there you see the freeway running along the coast. That is Highway 1. That is PCH. So if you look at that and you look at this round section in front, we're talking something that is a couple of miles across, a couple of miles out to sea. And you can see the ridge and you can see the coastline. Now, while you're still on this center picture, I want you to look right below the artificial setup that's there, this underground base. Look right in front of it. And you can see there are pillars in front of it supporting it. Now, if this is a couple of miles across, that means the thickness of the roof here is has got to be 100 feet, 200 feet thick. And it's real. This is not something that this is from Google Earth. Now, if you go to picture number one, I'm going to set this up correctly. Go to picture number one on the left. You can see where Santa Monica is. You can see Los Angeles. You see Beverly Hills. You can see Hollywood. You can see LAX, South LA, Manhattan Beach. You go up the coast. You go past Venice, past Santa Monica. There's Malibu. Then you see Point Magoo. And then you go up, and there's 
Port Wenemé, and that's the Marine Corps right there. So all of this um, where Point Magoo is, that is, you cannot enter the water there. You cannot swim, no boating, no nothing. Just like Area 51, no different. Same signs, same warnings, and those warnings are there too on Google Earth if you go there and look at the map. Okay? Now, what's curious is this. Now I want everybody to go to picture number three. That's the side view. That is an entrance to something. And as you can see, there is nothing around it. Nothing at all that matches what you're looking at. You're looking at a very thick, dare I say, bomb-proof, nuclear-proof entrance. You can see the columns there supporting it. And it looks like nothing else that is around it. This isn't... I don't want to talk about Mars photography and objects on the moon. That's not what we're talking about here. Your eyes aren't fooling you. What you are looking at is something crazily crazy. This is a head scratcher, and I think this is potentially explosive. There have been sightings of UFOs off the coast here, USOs, for decades. Decades. I didn't get around to posting any of the photographs that were sent to me uh, from literally dozens of people. This report that we put together has now circulated around Facebook. We've gotten it out there. We time-stamped it. We want everybody to know, not only other researchers, but the government themselves, that this is now out of the bag. I will be writing up a, an article over the next 24 hours. We will get that posted on the front of the website, and then we will then distribute it from there. I think this is absolutely nuts and absolutely crazy. Now, the point of all of this is there have been rumors about... Uh, a naval air station, or uh, I'm sorry, a naval base in in Nevada on the freeway between Reno and Las Vegas. And it's called Hawthorne, or it's right north of Hawthorne. Now, what's crazy about um, Hawthorne is it's, it, it, it's called the Undersea Warfare Training Center, and it's on a lake. Nobody really knows how deep the lake is, how big it is or anything. But what are you doing? And they changed the name, by the way. It's now called the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Now, what would they be doing with it up there on the freeway in between Las Vegas and Reno, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center? Unless there's access to it. And I'm challenging everybody. This right here, this photograph, that's your entrance. That's how you get there. There's been rumors about it for a long time. And and I feel that we are on to something here, and this could potentially be the entrance to Hawthorne. Also, possibly, China Lake. Now, China Lake sits out in the Mojave Desert, which is north, northeast of this entrance that you're looking at in Malibu. It's not too far from the studio here in Burbank. Just continue up the freeway here, jump on the 14, and, and you're there. You can be at the Mojave, I don't know, from here from the studio, 45 minutes, hour tops. You can be right there. That's where China Lake is. And China Lake, you would you ask yourself, why would the Navy have the largest landmass or second largest or largest landmass for the Navy installation in the world, <laughs> and it's in the desert, in Mojave. It's the largest single land holding for the United States Navy, representing 85% of the Navy's land for weapons and armament, ar armaments research, development, acquisition, testing, and evaluation. It's 38% of the Navy's land holdings worldwide, almost half, and it's in the desert. Think about all those Navy bases all around the world. How big is it? 
Its two ranges and main test site cover more than 1,100,000 acres. It's 4,500 square kilometers, an area larger than the state of Rhode, Rhode Island. As of 210, as, as of 2010, at least 95% of that land has been left undeveloped. It's got $3 billion of infrastructure on the installation consisting of 2,132 buildings and facilities. It's got 329 miles of paved roads and 1,801 miles of unpaved roads. It's huge. You want to question it? Just go to Wikipedia. Google it. China Lake. There's your entrance to it, right there. I think this is explosive. So I've got a bunch of other stuff. I want to thank everybody out there for for getting me uh, the information that you have. We are compiling it now. I'm I'm researching the best that I can with everybody. Thank you, thank you for the photographs. Thank you for for the, for the. It's just incredible what has been done. And the funny thing is. For everybody out there, this is a first. I think that's your I think that's your entrance. So I want to know. I email Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Tweet, text, do whatever you gotta do. Get it into me. Email Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You know anything, you've heard anything, you got any additional photography, any comments from anybody, anything that you know. Get it to me and get it to me now. We're going to do the release on this tomorrow. All right. What else we got going on? It's pretty cool, huh? It's pretty exciting. 19,000 square miles of unrestricted. and Oh, I didn't even mention. They have 19,600 square miles of restricted and controlled airspace at China Lake. Up to 12% of California's total airspace is occupied and restricted by China Lake, a naval air station. You've got Top Gun down in San Diego. Ain't nothing like this. And there's your entrance. I, I'm just, I'm just still, I, the more that this is uh, out there and the, the information that has been coming in from everybody, it's, it's just crazy, just absolutely nuts. Oh, man, I got to get to the news. I didn't even get to, uh, oh, man, okay, look. I'm going to take a quick two-second break. Got to get this out of the way. Got to pay the bills. Let's get this out of the way. And when I come back, uh, I'll get a couple of news headlines going in. And then uh, we'll be joined by Marshall Klarfeld. Tomorrow night, Dan Fogler, Balls of Fury, Fanboys. And then on Friday, Brad Olson. This is Fade to Black. The Wednesday edition. There you go, Bell Gap. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us, everybody. Don't touch that mouse. Church fade to black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I gotta tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states doesn't matter where you live give them a call i'm telling you they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals and that's exactly what you need my brother when you're taking on the evil three letter so seriously give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444 again 1-877-909-5444 or go check out their website dub 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 nat taxexperts.com that's n-a-t-t-a-x 
E-X-P-E-R-T-S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. KJCR, Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Yeah. <laughs> the Wednesday edition. If you go over to Twitter right now, and again, at J Church Radio, and and get the action going, DM, not N as in Nancy, M as in McDonald's, DM Radio Net. Head over there, and Dale has just posted this really cool picture of a USO popping out of the water behind a lifeguard shack at Point Doom. And where this is, you have to understand Point Doom. Look at the maps and everything that we just posted. Point Doom, that USO coming out of the water at that distance is exactly where we are talking about. And I'm looking at some of these posts right now on Twitter. Yes, it looks artificial. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, exactly. It is crazy. All right. <laughs> Leslie just tweeted, uh, Jimmy, please be careful and definitely watch your butt. You know what I'm talking about, dude. Exactly. But you know what? That, that That's exactly what this show is about. It's always been that way. It's about finding the truth. I want the truth. That's it. I want the truth. Speaking of the truth, going over to MH370, the undersea search for for 370 has been halted. You ready for this one? Not making it up. The Bluefin 21 broke down and they have no spare parts. That's right. They have no spare parts. They don't have spare parts for its transponder and of another malfunctioning part on the submersible itself. How is this possible? How is it possible? That is nuts. No spare parts for either device. This is according to CNN.com and also the release from Malaysia. Wow, kind of freaked out. Thought I had a spider on my leg. I'm wearing shorts. You know, it's 105 degrees outside. It's a cable. Freaked me out. No spare parts in the ship. And then... I got this I got this email and it the the article from this it was from March 23rd. Now remember reading it back then. But back then I was still in the hopes of something was going to be found with uh 370 and it was going to be a okay. But now this article I think is is very relevant to the situation. And the headline of the article reads as follows. Rothschild inherits a semiconductor patent for freescale semiconductors with the deaths of the 20 freescale employees that were on the plane. The disappearance of four members, four of the 20, of a patent semiconductor traveling on Malaysia Airlines MH370 makes the famous billionaire Jacob Rothschild at the sole owner of the important patent. Hmm. And I ask you, what are 20 employees of Freescale doing on that flight all at one time? Russia is to bail out of the space station. We point, posted this a couple of days ago, and now suddenly CNN has come on board with this story today. They didn't do it because of us. I'm just saying that uh, they're two days late. But Russia is to bail out of the space station. They don't want anything to do with it, do with it after 2020. And the other curious thing about this press release is they are saying now, and this is all has to do with Ukraine and, and the sanctions that we're doing. It. So now that's it. They don't want anything to do with the space station. And also no more rocket engines for us, and especially if they have military use. So they're, they've cut us off at the knees. <laughs> What are we doing depending on Russia for anything? What are we doing depending on them for rocket engines and Vostok and, and getting our astronauts up there and resupplying ISS? What, what, how did we get here? 
Get those space shuttles out of mothball. We've got one at a museum here in Los Angeles. Crank that thing back onto a flatbed. Get it back to Cape Canaveral. And there you go. But enough is enough. And then we have that X-37B anyway. So why aren't we using that to shuttle supplies up to ISS? And if we had to, I suppose we could stow away a, an astronaut or two on there, strap them down, duct tape them in, and get them up there. But what are we doing depending on the Russians? I just don't get it. Leaving us vulnerable to this kind of action is beyond me. All right. That's it. Uh, I want to say really quick, uh, and this is this is real. We go through this every year here in California. Right now, San Diego is on fire. We've got a total of eight out-of-control wildfires down there right now. Evacuations are going on, including Camp Pendleton, Carlsbad. Legoland has been affected, too. I think they've shut that down. And I just want to say right now, everybody down there be safe. Listen to the fire department, and when they say go, go. Don't hang out at your house with your garden hose standing on the roof thinking you're about to do something. Just evacuate. Here here in Burbank, every single year, everything burns down, and it's, it's absolutely nuts what we are faced with right now But it uh, every single year. But the wind has been cranking this past week. I mean cranking. And it's been really, really hot, hot, hot. And you combine those two and some doofus, and the next thing you know, everything burns. And that's what's going on in San Diego. Uh, uh, the last thing I read, I think right before the show, 15,000, 20,000 homes. The homes are burning right now, but uh, are, are in danger. And the evacuation is going on in Camp Pendleton. That is a major, major marine training uh, installation down there in Carlsbad. Oceanside, that area, which, uh, again, if they say go, you go. And our thoughts are with you. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is the Wednesday edition, Bell Gab. I'm telling you right now, in case you didn't know, this is Wednesday. When I come back, Marshall Klarfeld will be in the house. Don't touch that mouse, everybody. KJCR on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Oh, yeah. Fade to black on the Dark Matter Radio Network, the Wednesday edition. Follow us on Twitter, at JChurchRadio. Space Boy just said duct tape. <laughs> Did I say that? Yeah, it's a crazy situation going out there in Malibu. And again, everybody down in San Diego, be safe. It is a crazy situation going on there right now. All right. Marshall Klarfeld. A Caltech graduate engineer benefited from a lengthy career in business and politics. At a relatively young age, biblical questions propelled him into a 40-year passionate pursuit of the history of the Anunnaki. His research has uncovered theories that challenge the scientific community. 
One discovery may rank as one of the most important archaeological finds of the 21st century. I would like to welcome to the program Marshall Klarfeld. Marshall, are you with us, sir? Marshall? Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, there you are. I hit the wrong button. Oh, I do that. You know, it's funny. Uh, it, one out of two guests get the wrong button push. And unfortunately, tonight, Marshall. It's okay, as long as we're connected. Yeah, I apologize for that. You know, with all of these, uh, you know, everything going on down in San Diego, I know you're out, you know, in, in, in you know, out off the 10 freeway. But, um, yeah. you know, is are you guys in any danger? Is there anything going on out there right now? Are you going to be no, good? No, our temperatures are, are more moderate for this time of year than yours. You're in the Santana Santiana wind situation and I I've been in San Diego when that happens and it's not a lot of fun yeah I really feel for those people uh, my brother used to live there and I was concerned when those fires broke out now they break out in uh, Pacific Palisades and then you know Burbank and we don't have a lot of uh, trees out here I mean they're palm trees but <laughs> they're not dry and, and and brittle to the the wind yeah it's a you know it's a crazy phenomenon people talk about the you know the earthquakes here in southern california but what the rest of the country doesn't really understand and and it probably doesn't get that publicized but is what we deal with with fires and here the population is built out so much to the foothills of all of these mountains and living in the foothills and everything Seems like it seems like every year everything burns down and it gets and we fight this fight, you know, this 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 ebb and flow with Mother Nature. That's right. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I just got these reports right in before the show and I was thinking about you where you're at. And oh, all we've got is 150 golf courses, Jimmy, and they're filled with watering systems. <laughs> <'Cause> I'm pretty <laughs> wet. <laughs> uh, oh, man. All right, so uh, a couple of things uh, really quick. You know, let's just have fun and talk. And the, um, the Anunnaki, Marshall, has, has, has been a topic on this show uh, at least once or twice a week. And, and I wanted to reach out for the longest time to get you on the show. I mean, you are, you are well, one of the guys in the front. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, so let's visit that in a second. But before we go there, and also after you and I talk today, we're going to talk some time travel tonight. And so I, I definitely, I definitely want to go there because, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. But um, before we do, you're a Caltech graduate. And so that to me means a black and white life in that, you know, you're an engineer. You're, you're about mathematics and figures and physics and things that make yeah, well, sense I, uh, caltech's changed since i was there it's now co-educational <laughs> <laughs> wow I, when i entered caltech which interestingly enough jimmy it was in 1947 in the fall of 47 i became a freshman at caltech and uh, as you know roswell happened in the summer of 47 so the the buzzword around campus in the bull sessions was, what are UFOs? What is this thing that's happened just next door? Because Pasadena isn't that far from Roswell, New Mexico. Right. And um, I was blessed. I had two great teachers at Caltech. Uh, my physics professor was Richard Feynman, uh, the Einstein of my generation. And my uh, chemistry professor was Linus Pauling, who was also a Nobel laureate mm -hmm. in the future. And I had uh, a very interesting interface with these two uh, professors during my junior year there. And that was a couple of years after Roswell. I had been a biblical scholar before then, and I had all these questions. So I cornered uh, Feynman one day. At, we invited him to dinner at our, our house. And I said, Dr. Feynman, do you believe in UFOs? Now, I'm going to tell you, I published this in my first book, Adam the Missing Link, his direct quote to me. And I think it's something that you and the rest of your audience should ponder. He said, Clarfeld, I believe in the law of probability. The Milky Way has over 200 billion stars, just like our system, and there's 400 billion galaxies in the universe. He says, the law of probability states that there are 10,000 solar systems identical to ours, and we're the youngest. Our solar system is 4.5 billion years old. The universe is 14.5 billion years old. And then he went on to say the most significant part of the answer to my question. He said, if any of those 
other civilizations survived their space age, they could have come to visit us. Yes, I believe in UFOs. Now, that was in 1950. Can you imagine uh, a young 19-year-old undergraduate student asking the future uh, head of the physics world, Richard Feynman, if he believed in UFOs? And the next month, I invited uh, Linus Pauling to dinner. I was the social chairman of Fleming House at Caltech. And after dinner, I cornered uh, Dr. Pauling at the fi same fireplace where I'd, I'd questioned uh, Richard Feynman. And I said, Dr. Pauling, do you believe in God? Now, here's this brazen young 19-year-old kid asking his professor if he believed in God. Now, let me tell you the answer. I also published this in Adam, the Missing Link. He said, Clarefeld, our discipline is to explain everything that's gone on in the universe back to the beginning, which was the Big Bang. He says, if you were to ask me what there was a millisecond before the Big Bang, we don't know. If you wish to believe in God, please do. Now that, I think, is a terrific answer to the question, uh, is there a God? How did the man of science cannot explain what there was a millisecond before the birth of our Universe. Well, I I agree with that. Let's let's come back to that, uh, uh, okay. uh, please. But how did Feynman say something so extraordinarily visionary for 1947? Because these are the statements that you know astronomers today are saying yeah. as a modern well, statement. But we're talking you, 60, 70 years Feynman. ago. My my my. Uh interface with him went beyond just that one question and answer session. He was the most brilliant uh, teacher I've ever had. He could anticipate answers in advance of questions. But the interesting thing that he gave was a lecture to us in my junior year. It was called Room at the Bottom. And we said, okay, let's go listen to the Professor Feynman talk to us about Room at the Bottom. And what he was talking about was miniaturization. Now, get this is 1950. And he smoked like a chimney. He always carried a pack of camels in his vest pocket. And he opens his lecture, and he says, Gentlemen, quit looking up the ladder. Let's look down at the bottom. He says, There's room down there. He reaches in his pocket, Jimmy, pulls out this pack of camel cigarettes. This is in 1950. He says, One day the Library of Congress will be contained in a volume of this size. And we said, Wow, what is he talking about? How can they miniaturize things to that particular uh volume. Right. And then he offered us a prize. He says, if any of you gentlemen can create an electrical motor in the uh, confines of one cubic centimeter, I'll pay you $1,000. Now, that was a lot of money in 1950. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the guys did it. I mean, he said, you know, you have to build smaller tools, you have to build smaller everything, keep going down, down, down to the bottom till you get to build this little electric motor in a cubic centimeter. As an example, Next door to where I was living in Fleming House was a computer uh, room. The room was 30 feet long, 10 feet wide, and it was 15 foot tall, and it was filled with electronic vacuum tubes, wall to wall. This was the first computer. And when they turned on the electricity on the, on campus, the, the lights dimmed, Jimmy. <laughs> it was incredible. How much <laughs> I, 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 I bet they up. did. Right. And we, we, I've gone in my lifetime... In fact, I may be one of the few guys you talk to that was alive when Roswell happened. You know, I'm, I'm, I go back that far. But we have come from Feynman's putting the Library of Congress in, the, in a volume equal to the, uh, the uh, camel cigarette package to today's miniaturization. I'm looking at two computers on my desk that have incredible power, and they're so small and they're so light that we have achieved what he saw all those years ago. I mean, that's, that's 60 years ago. Absolutely. Seven years ago. Absolutely. So, well, that's, how I, that's how I got started in this search for, you know, what is the truth? What is the answer to all my questions? And I want to tell you another thing that I reported on just recently. There was an incident in uh, February of 1947. Not a lot of people know about it. It's called the uh, Operation High Jump. Admiral Byrd was commissioned by the President of the United States, um, Harry, Harry, Harry Truman, to take a military expedition to the Antarctica to, in search of a German supposed submarine base that was underneath the Antarctic. And uh, just eight weeks into that uh, operation, they were attacked by flying saucers coming out of the water, and they destroyed one of their surface ships, shot down most of the airplanes, killed many of their people and wounded them, and they 
turned around and hightailed it back. The mission was an eight-month mission called uh, Project uh, U.S. Navy Task Force 1947, Operation High Jump. It was Task Force 68. You can look this up on Google, and you'll see the facts. The, how we got this information, by the way, was the Russians have just declassified what they knew about Operation High Jump. And they have an hour-long uh, uh, video telling their side of the story, which has been covered up by our government. Mm -hmm. uh, Admiral Byrd's logs have never been uh, made to the public. They've been secreted for 67 years. And the Congress is now just talking about going back down to the Antarctic to retrieve the bodies 67 years later. This is a real hot potato, but I think it's the first incident in 1947 of a U.S. military expedition being attacked by flying saucers. And I think uh, if you don't know about it, you should research it. No, uh, high jump is, is very interesting. And one of the reasons why I thought that we were so encamped right now down in Antarctica was to deal with just that and to, and to find out what everybody was looking for. But then right. I found out this month, and I was shocked about this, that they're closing down um, half of our uh, of the base down there because of budget cuts, and they're pulling everybody back, and they're going with a skeleton crew. And I heard it, it, janitors or anybody that's any type of service personnel completely removed. So if you're a scientist down there now, a couple of days a week you have to mop floors and and but yeah. And I, I thought, why would they be doing that? And I just, I didn't understand. And that announced... Well, what's more interesting to me is that why uh, Admiral Byrd's logs and his, his diary have been kept secret by the government Absol for absolute, years. Absolutely. I mean, you know, what are they afraid of exposing? That, that there, He made one statement, I think, before they closed the, the, the door on him. He said, the next military encounter the United States faced, we better be prepared to deal with flying machines that go from pole to pole nonstop in instance. Well, uh, it definitely Byrd and the Navy um, and the White House at that time, they were acting on some intel that they had, period, plain well, and was, simple. it was the guys at Nuremberg. You right. Know, uh, Admiral, Admiral Donitz, who was uh, took the place of Hitler after he was supposedly disappeared, uh, confessed, or didn't come, he bragged that they had a, a, a secret sh Shangri-La base uh, under the ice in the Antarctica, and then they knew about the submarine traffic back and forth to this base, and they also were pretty much astounded at the technology that the Germans had come up with in World War II, which was way ahead of us, jet engines, rockets, V2s, V1s. I mean, where did this technology come from? And there also was some speculation that they had built a flying saucer. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'm suspicious of technology transfer. Wherever I go, whenever research I do, Jimmy, I always want to know how did these guys figure out how to do that when they didn't have the basic tools at the time. And that's what I write about in my books. I go to the iconic uh, sites around the world. In fact, the first book, Adam, is filled with over 14 different things like uh, the Giza Pyramids, uh, Stonehenge, uh, Baalbek Platform, Easter Island, Chichen Itza, et cetera. And I said to myself, you know, archaeologists are giving credit to, to nomadic people for building these things. <laughs> it's one of the it's it's one of the biggest head scratchers out there. How um, uh, orthodox archaeologists will sit there and talk to you know people like you and myself and say, you know, you know, you you guys, you want to just say it's it's, it's ancient aliens or you want to claim this, or you want to can't you give credit? That maybe they did it themselves. I'm thinking, credit to who? Cavemen? You know, yeah. I mean, well, I mean hunter gatherers. Yeah, hunter gatherers. You know. Right, right. No, well, I'm, the, I think the the answer to that question, Jimmy, which I have come to uh, comment on in all of my books, is that the easiest thing for an archaeologist to do is to look around and see what civilization existed at that time and give them credit for it. They said the locals did it. Yeah, you know, every place you go, Chichen Itza, you go to uh, Machu Picchu, you go uh, to the Egyptian pyramids. He said the local people must have built it because they were there. They don't think outside the box. And this is where I use my background, my engineering knowledge to reverse engineer things. And in all of my books, I, I fill them with pictures showing the detailed uh, artifacts that were constructed and how they were constructed and what was used and what was necessary to construct them. 
and say, you know, do you think the local people could have done that? They didn't have pulleys in, in Egypt. Uh, yeah, in Baalbek, uh, you know, a, a 400 ton rock just fell out of the sky. You yeah, know, they, right. you know and well, they moved it. They moved it a half a mile up a hill. You're and right. Lifted it 36 feet in the air and placed it perfectly end to end. Exactly. Without any mortar. I mean, give me a break. And, and every time uh, I look at what's the big one called, the Virgin Rock, the big one. And, oh, and, the the maiden, the, the pregnant lady. Yeah, yeah, the pregnant, the, the virgin, you know, the pregnant lady. Left, <laughs> I think they left that one on purpose in the in the quarry, just to say, see what we can do. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you look at that, and. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, look, I would like to think that we we had the ability to do that. Of course I do. But we didn't, and that's the end of the story. They yeah. didn't get out a bunch of chicken bones and carve that thing out, and let alone move it. And that's it. That's uh, When I was watching last night, Marshall, I, I, I do this probably three, four times a week. I go back, and I just do a little bit of... Uh, research on Giza. I love to look at the King's Chamber. I like, you know, I, I just like to, you know, to remind myself. Have you, have you closely examined the sarcophagus in that chamber? That's, uh, that's where I'm going right now. Okay. Uh, we were okay, talking about now. synchronicity earlier today. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we can stop this right now. But, but and to look at the way that uh, the granite and the red granite and the seams are done on the inside of that chamber and the roof of the chamber I'm sorry, 3000 BC. If you want to say, uh, Orthodox uh, archaeologists, if you want to come at me and say it's 3000 BC instead of older, okay, I'll 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 chew on that. But in 3000 BC, those were <laughs> those were, like you said, hunter gatherers. There wasn't any structure there, and there's just no way now, that now, that stuff here's got the other done. Thing that that goes along with that. My research has uh, found that the folks who are examining the Sphinx have come up with uh, two different theories of the age of the Sphinx due to some water erosion they found on the western wall that surrounds the Sphinx. And uh, one of them came up with 10,500 years when it rained in that part of the world and it caused that damage. And the other one came up with the Orion theory, which is the alignment of the pyramids and the stars in the sky, and they rolled it back and said that it was 10,500 years ago. Now, if either of those theories has any credibility, there were no Egyptians 10,500 years ago. I mean, but, that's that's another mind-boggling question. Who was around? You know, the Egyptians started about uh, 5,000 years ago, so this is twice the age of their civilization, so they can't take credit for it just because it landed on their soil. <laughs> well, their exactly, and not only that, when you have, uh, now we have Gobekli Tepe, and that, that just throws a wrench into everything. Oh, and, yeah, and, and, and guess what, Schmidt, you know, the German guy who's the archaeologist there? Right. He's come up with a new theory which bends everything out of reality. He said that in order for this to have been built, for Gobekli Tepe to have been built, the hunter-gatherers had religion before they had civilization. Therefore, their motivation was religious, and this is a religious temple. Even though he hasn't found any human artifacts in his digs, he's putting the thing cart before the horse. He says that the uh, construction of a, this monument, this temple to a religion, came before there was civilization. Now, that's that's trying to make a you know bend it around and make the banana fit. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and for all of those, I've said orthodox now five times tonight, but the for for all of archaeology to be so hell bent on on dates, and you know, three thousand BC, that's it. Don't don't talk to me about four thousand. If you want to push this to five thousand BC, you're out of your mind. There was mm -hmm. nothing there. Now. Mm -hmm. If, if 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 you want to have us, and I'm talking about you and I and everybody that's smart and listens to this program, if right. you want us to uh, to to have a belief system that there was no farming, there was no wheat, we hadn't we hadn't figured things out yet, and there were hunter gatherers. Now you have Gobekli Tepe, where there were thousands of people building that monument, a city, right. an organization, leaders, no, no government. Trace of it. No trace of it, and then they turn around and buried it, and, yeah. and so so now what say you, Orthodox? You know now come at me because now yeah. we have a seven thousand year gap 
in, in between Gobekli Tepe and and the pyramids. So right. the only way that, or that Stonehenge, they always use Stonehenge and they throw it in there. Exactly. So what does that what does that mean about the pyramids? What that means about the pyramids is I think the pyramids are probably fifteen thousand years old. You know, okay. fourteen thousand years old, and they were well, already I'm there. We're, we're, I'm glad we're talking about this, Jimmy, because uh, you know I'm at the time in my life where uh, I don't do this for a living. This is just I'm I'm a curious person with an inquisitive mind, and I love to dig around and do my own research and take everybody else's uh, facts that they find, kind of fit them together, and see if there's something new that tr is truthful that comes out of it. And the most interesting thing that's happened is that, uh, let's take the Great Pyramid. The interior of the Great Pyramid is watertight. Every passageway, the, the, the uh, tunnels going down to the pit, the uh, entranceway and up to the uh, Grand Gallery and all the way up to the Queen's Chamber and the King's Chamber, everything is watertight. And I came across in my uh, third book a new theory that I've, I've propounded, and not a lot of people are speaking about it yet, but I think eventually it will come to the forefront. It's called washboard gold mining. I wanted to ask you about. I'm glad you brought that up. So let's. Uh, do you mind if we spend a few minutes no, on that? Of course not. I'd love to. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, I've read about it, and it's it's. Uh, I think it's an eye opener. So, for everybody out there that doesn't know, go ahead and do the definition. <laughs> what is okay, washboard? Well, uh, the, the 49ers in California had a sluice box to try to retrieve alluvial gold. Alluvial gold is. Uh, uh, nature strips the gold veins into water and forms what's called placer gold that floats around in the water, and then it bangs together and forms nuggets. And then they, because gold is 19 times heavier than water, it drops down into the sand. So they scoop the sand up with this uh, sluice box, and it, it has a washboard surface at a tilted angle. So they run the slurry down the washboard, and the ribs of the washboard bang the gold down into the crevices and that's how they separate it from the mud and the water well i one day was sitting around looking at the chichen itza which is a step pyramid and i know that there was a water supply nearby there's a, a, a cenote which when i was there uh, 20 years ago was filled up to the top but now the water surface has gone down and the underground rivers in Mexico are filled with alluvial gold. And I said, wouldn't it be interesting if they pumped the alluvial water gold out of that water source right by and took it to the top of this pyramid and let it bounce down slowly across the terraces just like a washboard and collected gold. So that's where my theory came from. And I looked at Machu Picchu. You always see the traditional picture of Machu Picchu, which is the mountain in the background in this kind of open area with a bunch of beautifully fashioned stone buildings in the foreground. But if you draw away from it, go to another peak, a mountain peak, and there are pictures of this, and you look at the entire site, it's all terraces. It's a stair step, it's, yeah, top to bottom. The whole thing is just a, a washboard terrace. Right. And and now the river that goes around that peak, if you look on the Google map, you'll see that the Machu Picchu was built on a mountaintop that is surrounded by the Urubamba River, which is filled with placer gold, and the elevation of the river on the uh, east side is higher than the elevation when it goes around the corner and on the left side. It would be easy to even just siphon that placer-filled water up to the top of Machu Picchu and let it run over these terraces and collect your gold. What would the purpose be, uh, aside from collecting gold? The purpose of what? Of, of, of washboard mining. Would there be... A, a, oh, okay. A, Here's what happened. They had deep mines in, in southeast Africa... Uh, way back in the beginning of their search for our gold, and, and uh, they all got inundated by the flood 11,000 years ago so that the operational uh, activities that they had, they lost their cities, they lost their uh, the processing uh, towns that they had built in Mesopotamia to do the processing of gold, which was in an ore form. And somebody, probably like Enki, who was a smart guy, figured out they could separate the gold more easily if they just took the water that nature was stripping the gold mines with and separate the gold out of the water. And what I've found is that on the iconic sites that I published in my third book called uh, The Anunnaki, we're here, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, sites like Machu Picchu, uh, the Great Pyramid interior, the, the zigzag walls at uh, uh, north of Cusco, 
These are all step pyramids. Now, the zigzag walls happen to be a vertical step pyramid instead of a horizontal one. And then there were th hundreds of and perhaps thousands of uh, step pyramids built in Central and South America. Um, Planeque is an example. And every place I looked, Jimmy, I found placer water running in a, in a beautiful irrigation system. They were masters of, of water transfer and irrigation, building uh, channels and tunnels. And um, it just blew my mind, so I decided to go public with it. And I, in that book, I uh, theorized that the interior of the Great Pyramid, which the Grand Gallery, is a cobalt ceiling. It's an upside-down washboard. Right. And if they pumped water in there and it banged up before it got to the king's chamber, it would knock the gold down. There's 27 slots going up the Grand Gallery on each side, which would be the collection area for the gold. And then the box in the king's chamber has got damage on all its exterior surfaces. If, you, if the water entered the king's chamber, according to Archimedes, this hollow box would float and it would bang around against the interior walls, causing the damage that we see. Nobody's ever explained why the box has all this damage on it. And then in one corner, it looks like the damage got down low enough for water to come into the box and sink it. And, you know, after many re re repetitive cycles of, of mining gold, they took the Nile River, which was filled with placer gold from the Nubian gold fields, and they pumped it up into the, uh, using a, hydraulic pulse pump, which was in the pit. And I explain all this in my book, The Anunnaki Were Here. I show pictures. One of the main features of my books are that they're easy to read. I uh, don't do a lot of verbalization. I take many, many colored pictures and put them together to show the physical evidence that I think supports my my theory of washboard gold mining. I was, wa I, I, I was watching last night. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I was watching last night. It's interesting. We're talking about this. Uh, a video uh, of the water damage inside of the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. And and looking at, and it's a definite, it's not, I don't think it's speculation. I don't think there's any other way to interpret it. When you look at the discoloring of the walls and also the slots that you're talking about and, and the grand staircase. And, yes, right. Yeah, that um, he was theorizing the same thing that those he didn't mention gold, but he was saying that that was a water collection point that the water came down the stairs right. and and co the condensation would collect off of the walls. The, uh, there's water damage on the ceiling, on the walls, and then would collect in each one of those uh pits now the pits that you and i are referring to so everybody understands when you look at when you look at the staircase going up to the king's chamber or down yeah, it's depending, at an angle 26 degree angle yes uh on both sides you see it's about one they're about one foot wide by maybe two two and a half feet tall these rectangular pits that's the best way to describe it and they're they're evenly spaced and they're right. there for no apparent reason Oh, if right. you know what I mean, it's it's not right. decorative. It's certainly not now that. Now I'm going to lay something on you that I just discovered this summer, bring I mean, it. this spring. Bring it, bring it. There's there's a myth called uh, Jason and the Golden Fleece. Yes. You're familiar with that? Myth. Absolutely. I went to Russia, Georgia, on the Black Sea, and I found out that's where they use this system of gold mining in the rivers. There, they take sheepskin, which is uh, uh, a fleece. And it's filled with lanolin, and all the fibers are covered with lanolin, and they'd put it on a board and, and hold it under the water in the, in a river, and it would collect gold until it turned completely golden. All the particles would collect on the fleece, and that's where this myth of the golden fleece came from. Now, if you took sheepskins and you uh, secured them in those uh, 27 pockets, it's just about the right size, and the gold came down through the water, it would collect on the fleece in those containers just like they did in the olden days on the rivers. And I think this might be the the crowning uh, pinnacle to my theory of washboard gold mining. Everybody's always asked me, well, how do they collect the gold off of the terraces? Well, if they put sheepskin on the terraces, that would collect the gold, and then they just uh, do the same thing as the ancient Romans and the Greeks did. I just got a tweet that just came in from Dale, and he says, and Dale is a 30-year friend of mine, by the way, uh, Marshall. Okay. And he, he says... I'm a gold prospector. 
would there be there would be piles and piles of tailings did marshall find those i don't even know what a tailing is what's a tailing no 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 see the water that what they did is they built a dam a coffer wall around the, the great pyramid and they they filled it with Nile water until it got up to the entrance. The entrance is not on ground level, as you know. It's up uh, 36 feet, I think, above the ground. Right. So they'd fill the Nile River water, which is just plaster gold, is encapsulated in uh, micro uh, bubbles in the water. And the water would go down to the pit. In other words, there was a, a channel that goes from the entrance down to the pit, which is underground, by the way. And it's through granite. They they bored a four and a half or four foot square tunnel at a perfect angle down to the pit. And when the water got down there, it would hit this hydraulic pulse pump, which would bang it up. And that's what the resonant chambers were above the king's chamber. The resonant stones was to handle the banging of this hydraulic pump and force the water up into the grand gallery in surges. So it would surge up, back, up, back until it filled the grand gallery went into the king's chamber, floated the sarcophagus, which banged around, and the process would be back forth. In other words, a surge up and down, pushing it against the cobalt ceiling of the Grand Gallery, which was knocking the gold particles down into these uh, 27 collection uh, uh, holes in the, in the floor of the Grand Gallery. Now, I, I published that in my book, The Anunnaki Were Here, as the culmination of my washboard gold mining theory. Most people who are gold miners, like your friend, mm -hmm. they go and they take the alluvium or the sand in the river beds and separate the gold out of that because it's dropped down and it's become mixed with the sand. So you have to separate the sand and the, and the alluvium from the gold particles. What would the... You don't have to do that when you're dealing with river water. What's the purpose the river water of... Is, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be hopefully manufacturing a little sled with a sheepskin on it for people to take out like your friend and, and just drag it in the, uh, rivers or streams they think are filled with gold plaster water and collect their gold that way instead of going to all the trouble of trying to pan it out through the sand. What's It'll the purpose fun. What's the purpose of the floating sarcophagus in the king's chamber? That's a good question. I haven't figured it out. I know that it, it, it created pressure, back pressure on the water. As the water surged up and down, there had to be something to push it back down. And if, it, if the sarcophagus floated in the king's chamber and the, and the water system was completely connected, it would cause a downward pressure to help the surging back and forth. That's all I can think about. Okay. Is the, is, do you know if the sarcophagus is fixed to the floor? I mean, no, it's it, not. It, it's it, it ended up there. No, that's where it, it sunk. I think when that one corner got beaten up enough so that the water came in. And Archimedes said it would float until some water got in it. And once it filled with water, it would sink. Right. So that's my theory. And I'm sticking my challenge to the archaeological community to prove me wrong on that. Mm -hmm. I think I've discovered one of the most interesting uh, new applications of uh, ancient archaeology. The reason these things were built were gold collection sites. They were gold mining sites, and I'm sticking by that. And, and my uh, theory, I think, is valid. And I've, I, by the way, I've made a YouTube. If you go to my YouTube page, uh -huh. you'll see a, a, a 10 minute YouTube on how that worked and where it also worked at, at places like uh, Tiwanaka, which is a big washboard system of uh, pyramids down in Mexico. Well, we'll get to, we'll get the YouTube links up. Uh, uh, I'm sure they're working on it right now. As soon as they hear you mention it here at the uh, studio, they they you know. Uh, let me give it to you. I've got it right here on my screen, and I can just spell it out for you if you want to write it down. Oh, you can also just uh, shoot me a quick email, and the producers will pick it up in the other room. Um, uh, now you're challenging me. On something that <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, uh, but real quick, Marshall, the yeah. um, uh, uh, back to the pyramids really quick with the timing of that. And I'm talking about, you know, 3000 B.C. or so. Um, is this tied with Sumeria uh, and the Anunnaki? And are you oh, said yeah. you, well? B oh, before yeah. you say, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> what I mean is, All right, are right. you well, uh, according to my research, Jimmy? Uh -huh. um, I believe that uh, the story of them arriving on this planet and um, 
looking for gold, that whole translation of the early cuneiform tablets, and I think there's a, a consensus that that was what they were here for. They had problems at home and they needed gold and they didn't have any gold, so they came to strip our planet as much as they could. And it started when they landed, apparently, according to the early translations, they landed in the Persian Gulf and tried to suck the soil off the floor of the Persian Gulf and separate the gold that way. In other words, the original process was was uh, mining uh, by vacuum, vacuuming the soil with the gold that had come down from Turkey. See, Turkey is the main source of gold in that part of the world, and nature strips uh, the gold and it flows down in the Tigris Euphrates rivers and goes into the Persian Gulf. And uh, they separated that. It didn't work too well, so they uh, made a survey of the planet. They discovered the main veins of gold were down in uh, southeast Africa, and they, they went down there and established underground gold mining there. This was hundreds of thousands of years before the flood, and they were then built a bunch of cities in the uh, Mesopotamian uh, area for the processing of the gold, and there are there's evidence they've dug up these ancient cities uh, that were inundated by the flood 11,500 years ago. But once they lost their primary source, they had to revert to something that was, uh, I think, very clever, and uh, we still do it today. I mean, people are still using sluice boxes and washboard gold mining to separate alluvium, uh, separate the gold from alluvium in water. They were doing it directly from water. And every place that I've uh, announced in my uh, third book, the Anunnaki were here, all the sites, which were I called gold mining sites like Machu Picchu and all the terraces and the step pyramids at Chichen Itza, et cetera, were gold mining sites and had alluvial water right next door. And I find this all over the world. I find it in India. I find it like in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. That's a whole other story, but that Anger Watt system was gold mining, uh, the purpose for it. Well, I also, believe. I, the, oh, you know what? Let's back up because I want to talk about Pumapunku too as well um, and how the Anunnaki could possibly uh, be involved there. I find that uh, a, a strange story, but let's back up for where, a second. Where was that again? Pumapunku down in uh, Oh, Pumapunku. Yeah, yes, right yes. There. That's the mystery of all mysteries. That is the mystery <laughs> of all mysteries. And uh, <laughs> well, well, in Gobekli Tepe, and there I've said Gobekli Tepe now five times tonight. But um, let's back up for a second. I was, uh, you and I were talking earlier, and one of the fascinating things for me, and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, but here you are, a Caltech guy, and and you start to get into uh, uh, you know ancient Sumerians and 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 the history uh, of the planet. Yeah, the, the history. history yeah, exactly. Civilization. How yeah. you've got to explain to me and everybody else how did this happen? Take us back. Take me back forty years. Okay. What what Here's was it that you read where you just stopped? You put the book down and you said, okay. I'm going here. You know, yeah. uh, what happened? Yeah. Well, my, one of my curiosities, Jimmy, was where our species came from. There is no uh, direct evolutionary chain of skeletal remains from Homo erectus, which was the uh, populace that looked, they were creatures. They looked like us. They walked upright. They had a third our brain size. They had no vocal cords. They couldn't talk. And in a million, eight hundred thousand years of uh, evolution, they, we've been told, by the scientific community. Uh, the most advanced they got in tool making were uh, spears and stones. Now, that's a million eight hundred thousand years of evolution and a species which is a creature, Homo erectus, which is the upright walking hominid that was before our species, Homo sapiens. Now the skeletal remains of Homo sapiens appear in Southeast Africa about 200, 250,000 years old, which is very young in the evolutionary scheme of things. It's, a, it's, it's a, a, a drop of sand. But in the short 200,000 years, we're walking on the moon. Our tooling has advanced from primitive people to space-age people. And that does not happen in evolution. You don't progress that rapidly. So there had to be some kind of intervention that caused our species to first appear out of nowhere. There's no skeletal remains from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens that prove that we evolved directly from 
uh, homos erectus. So I said to myself, well, something had to happen. And uh, about 1997, I picked up uh, The Twelfth Planet by Zachariah Sitchin. And this was a guy that really kind of uh, was talking about things that that seemed to fit my question and answer in my search for the truth. You know, how did this happen? And his translations from the cuneiform tablets of the Sumerian civilization was filled with information that fit. You know, I'm I'm a tire kicker. Uh, I, I live in a three-dimensional world, and I have to have evidence to prove that uh, this guy was right. So I, my first book, Adam the Missing Link, I said, okay, let me see if I can prove that Zachariah Sitchin uh, wasn't correct. So I, I put together the book, and the more I dug and researched, and the more evidence that I found, and I'm talking about physical evidence, the Giza pyramids, Stonehenge, the Baalbek landing platform, Easter Island, Chichen Itza, et cetera, I said, you know, something went on, and this guy's telling me that these translations say that it was an alien species that colonized the planet Earth 400,000 years ago, and that in, along the way they needed a, a slave species, so they created with DNA um, a manipulation from the creature Homo erectus, the Homo sapiens. And I said, well, you know, we do that. I know about DNA. I know about cloning. And um, then I read the story of Gilgamesh. You're familiar with that story. Oh, yes. Right? And the first thing that jumps out at you is that the Anunnaki cloned an adult duplicate from the DNA of the king. I said, hmm, that's more advanced than anything we've ever attempted. But they're talking about, and they, there's cylinder seals that show Jimmy, Gilgamesh and his twin, holding a, a spiral helix, a DNA column between them. That's in the British Museum. So as I go through my research and my questioning, and, and when I finished the book, Adam, The Missing Link, I said, no, I think i got to go along with this guy because I, I want to find out more about him. But I, I, I developed a 10-year uh, relationship with Zachariah Sitchin. That was in 1999, uh, 1998, I think it was. Anyway, uh, we'd talk on the phone, and I'd meet, and we'd have uh, – uh, he was my teacher. He was my third or fourth significant teacher in my life. There was Feynman, Pauling, a guy named Wallace Johnson, and a guy named Zachariah Sitchin. And from those four incredible teachers, I got my core belief, which I am founded in and which I today uh, feel very comfortable, Jimmy, that that's what happened. Now, some people can try to prove that that's wrong. Some people can say that, you know, he didn't have credentials or whatever. But you don't need credentials to be smart. Let's look at Einstein. He was a, a, a clerk in a patent office who came up with E equals MC squared, right? Well, with Zachariah, did, uh, to be really clear here, did he, I'm being devil's advocate for a second, I'm putting that hat on, did he actually could he read the writing on the on the clay tablets when when we talk about his translations yes those, the, the those were clay. his translations correct correct but he verified the stories with the bible he was a biblical scholar a hebrew scholar and uh, there were certain stories that everybody believes that the history of humankind is all wrapped up in the bible and nothing happened before the bible well that's not true there were thousands and thousands of years of, of history of humanity that, that started before the Bible. And I think he opened the window. He was able to uh, put together, uh, he taught himself how to translate Sumerian cuneiform. He uh, analyzed over 2,000 of the scientific cuneiform tablets. There's, there's maybe 300,000 of those tablets been found so far. 120,000 of them are in the British Museum. And the cylinder seals. I and, and, with the yes, system. and 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 I actually wrote that down. I want you to, uh, for everybody out there, um, ex explain what a cylinder seal is. Okay, great, good question, Jimmy. Uh, <clears throat> imagine a, a, a wine bottle cork, only a little bit smaller than a wine bottle cork, made out of a stone called hematite. Hematite has a Mohs hardness of uh, equal to steel. Now, in this little polished stone cylinder on the surface around the vertical part of the cork is engraved negative images very, very precisely. And then when you roll this uh, cork over wet clay, it gives you a positive picture story. 
it unfolds. It was kind of like the first printing press. But because it was made out of hematite, which is a very hard and, and survivable stone, it has lasted for six, 7,000 years, these cylinder seals. And the picture stories that they portray are magnificent to corroborate the, the translations from the, the cuneiform tablets. In fact, nobody to this day has figured out the technology that was used to create uh, negative pictures on a, a cylinder that's as hard as steel to the point where in one of them, my favorite one, uh, the guys have high-heeled shoes. <laughs> well, they're unbelievable to look at, too. When you yeah. look at them, they are just, they're, they're, it's fine art. I, I don't know, like you said, I don't know how it's done. It's hematite, um, but because it's hematite, it, it, it's held up, and they're beautiful. It would take something harder than hematite to engrave it, uh, Jimmy, like something like diamond. And how diamond do you think group. they, well, and what's your theory on that? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've tried to research it. I've tried to find the technology that would have created these, and it, it's still a mystery. It wasn't They're chicken bones. I, I can tell you that. It wasn't chicken bones. No, it wasn't bones. chicken bones, and it wasn't uh, antlers. And the tools that were available to the uh, early civilization. Now, here's another thing that Zechariah pointed out, which I think is quite uh, telling, is that the Sumerian civilization appears out of nowhere. And with the civilization comes writing, music, philosophy, mathematics, all the first, the wheel. The wheel, Everything that's yep. necessary to make a civilization appears in Samaria, and the Samarians wrote on the cuneiform tablets that everything that they had was given to them by the Anunnaki. Well, Technology I, transfer. And and one, one of the biggest, uh, you know, we have mathematics and we have the wheel and we have these obvious things, but one of the big technological jumps that was very significant for all humankind was farming and accounting yeah. and right. and that came all of this this wealth of this huge jump forward all happened at the same time with the same people yeah now, now ask yourself this this is another question that he proposed and, and we discussed it together you take people who are isolated. You go to New Guinea and you go to some islands where people have not been touched by modern civilizations. They evolve hunter-gatherers to a certain level and it stops. Their technology doesn't get any further because they don't need it. So then you've got to ask yourself, why were the Samarians so blessed with all these firsts? Where did it come from? It had to come from a uh, technology transfer. It happens in history all the time. The Spanish conquistadors transferred their technology to the Native uh, Americans in, in South America and Central America. What do you do when, when you hit the wall of skepticism and skeptics and, and debunking that, that comes forward when it comes to Sitchin and these subjects? Well, I let them do what they want to do. I, I mean, I'm not preaching anything, and I'm, I'm not uh, out there trying to convince people right. that they should believe what I write about. What I'm doing is I'm presenting facts, figures, and evidence and let you people, my, my audience makes up their own mind what they want to believe. I don't uh, definitely say this is how it happened. I just ask the questions, how could it have happened? So people who are debunkers, like uh, there are several of them out there that uh, want to gain some notoriety for themselves, fine, let them go ahead. If people want to believe that, that's, that's okay with me. I, in my core, Jimmy, have convinced myself over 67 years that I've been at this thing that I found the truth. And I'm, I'm so happy with it, and I'm so satisfied with it that I'm sharing it. My books are just uh, attempts to allow people to share the information that is very, very difficult to obtain from Sitchin's books. I told him, I said, you know, you write beautifully, you're very precise, but your book's putting people to sleep. <laughs> it's hard to, to read through them. Right. And it I asked him, I said, would you mind if I did a Life magazine of your books? of your thoughts and your theories. He said, no, as long as you give credit for Citroen whenever you use any of my stuff. I said, fine. And, uh, with permission from Zachariah Citroen, it's all through my books. I use that whenever I use any of his stuff. But I've gone beyond him now. He, he passed away, I think, in 08. He passed away on my birthday, actually. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's, I, when I think of when he, because I know when he died, and it happened on my birthday, and I always think about that. Actually, let me look it up here. Hold on. He died. Da, 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 da. 
Uh, oh, the day before my birthday is October 9th. My birthday is yeah, October right. 10th. Yeah, October uh, the 9th. Right. Yeah, uh, 2010. And 2010. like I said, they probably announced it on my birthday. And like I said, it, 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 that I, I think strange. And, you know, so that's how I always remember when he passed away. It was well, on my you birthday. know, he was a, a super senior. I think he was 89 and he was still writing books. Uh, 1920 to 2010. Yeah, he was 89 years old. Absolutely. Right. And I was born in 1929, so I'm pretty close to his age. Now, <laughs> did were you were you Pardon? able to find any errors in his translations? I mean, no, I didn't find errors, but I found questions. For instance, I, I said to myself, they didn't need all that gold for the purpose that they said it. What were they doing with the gold? besides uh, saving their atmosphere, if that was the story. that you know, And I said, do you believe everything they wrote? You know, they're the authors. The only authors we have are the, the victors, and they're writing the story the way they want us to understand it. Right, right. Uh, and I said, what do you think about all the extra gold? Was it possible that they, they converted it into white powder and, and ingested it? <laughs> right. <laughs> he, he said, Marshall, the, the record speaks for itself. He wouldn't go there, Jimmy. I couldn't get him outside of what... He was reporting. His, his records were reports to him. He just thought he's, uh, himself as a reporter. And I was thinking that, you know, there must have been some other uses for the gold because they didn't need all the gold they were collecting. I, they had I, to be using it for, for I, something else. I, I don't want to change the subject, but I got this a uh, uh, couple of emails that have come in. And before we get away from ourselves a little bit further, I just want to bang this out there. Uh, why are the granite walls of the king's chamber undamaged by the battering of the granite box? Yeah, I asked myself that same question, Jim. And the only thing I can say is that the stone that the sarcophagus is made out of is less hard than the walls. It have to be, you know, you always have a Mohs scale from 1 to 10 of hardness. You know, something is harder than what you're banging it with, than the thing you're banging with it will chip. So are, is, the box, this, are, is the sarcophagus also granite? Are they both just different yes. grades no, of granite? different kinds of granite, yeah, different kinds. And one obviously is harder than the other. I always wondered why that one corner was damaged. It never made sense, and there was yeah, never well, a lid. if you look at the bottom of it, I've, I've got a close-up picture of it that shows that every edge on all the sides, the vertical edges and the bottom edges and the side edges and the top edges are all damaged. They're all rounded, actually. They're all rounded, yeah. Yes. So they must have been banging around in there when it floated. Yeah, that people may... said to me, you know, that box wouldn't float. I said, check Archimedes. <laughs> well, the, the, the sarcophagus, for me, it's the one thing out of the entire pyramid, out of everything there that is not precise – Everything is, is, is perfect and cornered and finished right. and done, right. and then you have this, this beat-up. Banged-up box, yeah. Now, to me, Jimmy, that's the smoking gun. That's the thing that I think will prove that my washboard gold mining theory, and by the way, the water that was expelled from the pyramid, uh, the Nile River water had to be discharged after the gold was separated from it, could have flowed, flown, flowed easily over the plain to where the Sphinx was and caused the erosion. That's my thir third theory about the erosion on the Sphinx. Well, that would upset Robert. That would up upset Robert Shock a lot. I know. I know. I, I upset a lot of people with my theory. <laughs> um, well, but this is the other thing, and I've had uh, Doctor Shock on this show, and he's somebody that I I really really respect, and and. For him to think outside of the box and confront and uh, all of the Egyptologists out there, and not only that, right. but the geologists that he deals with too, as well, right. with his theories, I, I I really hold him in in high regard. But but there's another thing that he with with everything that he is proposing, he's going back to that magic number too, which is ten thousand five hundred years. Yeah, and, and also the question is, if there was that much rainfall, why wouldn't there be water erosion damage on everything well i uh, there's another thing that i propose though and and and, and i haven't heard anybody really talk about this i've heard a kind of mentions about it but it, it it's very simple when you look at the great pyramid forget about khufu i i just he had nothing to do with it if anything else he sat on it once but he had nothing to do do with the building of it and that is there's no hieroglyphics in that 
building. That's right. There's nothing. Not a tomb. Nothing. No tomb. Nothing. And forget about the graffiti at the top of the king's chamber. That could have been done right. at any time by anybody. Right. So I, I don't buy into that either. And they never buried anybody above ground, no, above the entrance. That's right. So when you look at I think that when e e Egypt, uh, the Egyptian society rose and came uh, to power, uh, lower and upper Egypt was unified, and the right. scorpion king came into play. When all of that happened, those pyramids were already sitting there. They That's just right. they inherited them. Yes, I I just think they were there, just like when uh you know with the with the fall of Cleopatra and everything that happened with the Roman Empire and Greece and everything at that time in the turn of the century, right. um when uh the turn of the the, the uh, A D when all of that went down they didn't five hundred years go by a thousand years go by Napoleon rolls through. In 17, 1800, when all of that, had, nobody knew what the pyramids were there for. When the Arabs showed up and raided them, nobody was uh, hanging out in Cairo at 700 AD to explain to them what the pyramids were there, or, you know, why exactly. they were there. So, and you know, that, that repeats itself, Jimmy, like the Incas, they're given credit for Machu Picchu. And every place you go, the Stonehenge, the, the, the tribes on the Salisbury Plain are given credit for that. And in India, the, the local folks are given credit for the temples there. And in, in Angkor Wat, that, that whole series, even the Great Wall of China, I found a section of the Great Wall of China that's built out of granite stones put together without masonry that's a washboard gold mining site, the original section of the Great Wall of China. So I'm, I'm expanding my research to find more and more evidence of an advanced alien technology that was on this planet thousands of years ago and it's the core of my belief that that's how these things came to be that i cannot envision nomadic people who are hunter gatherers having any kind of tooling or imagination to have done these things yeah it you know, again and it goes back to uh puma punku as well uh, oh hold on i have a quick question uh, sure. uh, again this where are the water channels needed to bring the water to the pyramids Okay, what they did is they built a coffer dam. There's a dam that went around the outside perimeter of the pyramid, and they filled that with water from the Nile River. The upper Nile River was easy to flood around the pyramid and taking the water level up to the entrance. Well, there so is a, there is a there is a canal that does go up to the entrance um, where you know possibly they they floated boats up. Uh, so well, that, that they, could they be... know that there was this perimeter wall. There's evidence of it. Right. And uh, it, it, they were clever. These guys, uh, you know, the more I, I reverse engineer things and see how they were done and, and discover the pieces that put the puzzle together, for me, I'm in awe. I'm in awe of their technology, and they've got things that I don't even understand. They're tooling like the Bull of Heaven in Gilgamesh. You remember that story? Yes. And, and Ishtar, who got ticked off because uh, Gilgamesh wouldn't sleep with her, <laughs> goes up to her mothership and, and gets uh, connives with her grandfather, Anu, to take the bull heaven down to Uruk and blast 200-foot trenches right. in the city of Uruk, killing people. I mean, it's written in the story of Gilgamesh. Now, what was the tool? What was the bull of heaven? It breathed fire and it dug trenches. Well, to me, that's some kind of power beam technology. When? And I know that in my research on the Great Pyramid at Giza, that the the foundation for those three pyramids was a, a granite mountaintop that was leveled over uh, many, many, many acres to plus or minus half an inch. Before the pyramids were built, they had to have a, a rock foundation in which to handle the weight of all the stones that were going to pile up on top of it. And there's evidence of power beam uh, leveling that mountain, uh, that hilltop, the, the plateau is just above the river and in my book uh the adam the missing link i found a picture of cairo you're going to love this jimmy cairo is, is to the east of where the pyramids are right and if the power beam was directed towards the hilltop in the uh, west to east direction i found a picture a painting of cairo around 1700 and east of the river nile and east of the city of of cairo are Ten mountaintops that are lopped off perfectly. <laughs> the tops are just flat. Uh, that's... And I said, uh-huh, overspray. 
Star being <laughs> so powerful that it went, besides leveling the, the foundation for the pyramids, it shot across the river, and, and there were some mountain peaks over there and just lopped them off. And I said, now, how could that happen? Unless there was some super technology. And I, I, I have a three-picture a diagram of, of how I think it happened. And, of course, this is speculation on my part. But there's evidence there that you have to deal with. You have to say, well, you know, how did that happen? And, and they talk about the Enlil used a power beam to level the foundation of the Baalbek platform in, in Lebanon. He went to the... Well, it the sounds similar Lebanon, to to the, sounds similar the, to the mountaintops in Nazca as well. Say again? It sounds similar to the mountaintops in Nazca in Peru. Yeah, exactly. It was exactly. there? Uh, what about the the loose change, the rocks that were left over from the mountaintops in Cairo? Where what happened with that? I don't know. Okay, uh, that's <laughs> interesting. And here's the other thing that you know that mountain peak that Machu Picchu is on is a granite mountain peak, and there are level uh, fields on the top of that mountain. Now, who had the tooling to level a granite mountain top and build those terraces? Those terraces had to have a foundation, a level foundation which meant you had to uh, remove granite before you could build the terrace. What was the year uh, uh, for Gilgamesh, the original story? Oh, nobody knows. See, it, that's, this is the first story on the planet, and uh, it has, besides the, um, the DNA of the king, it has, I think, five significant parts of the story that make it uh, fascinating. And, of course, the 11th tablet, which is in the British Museum, the 11, there's 12 tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the 11th tablet tells the original story of the Great Flood. The Noah story is there a thousand years before the Bible. And, of course, the Bull of Heaven and Ishtar, they found a statue of Ishtar with her space helmet. It's called Shugara in Samarian, and Shugara means goes far into the universe. And... Um, the, there was cohabitation. This is what's fascinating to me. The story of Gilgamesh, which, by the way, my second book is called Gilgamesh 10, for your audience if they're interested. It's written in a screenplay format, and we're hoping to make a major film out of it this summer. That's just a back burner item that's going on. <laughs> but, <laughs> right on. I mean, it's, it's a challenge and a half, right? Right. Well, anyway, you, you're in the right uh, place. The, the story of the people of Uruk pleading with their leaders, the Anunnaki, to get rid of this king who was raping all their brides. He was not a, a really nice person at that time in his life. And so who were the people they appealed to? They appealed to the Anunnaki. They went to Ishtar, and Ishtar went up to Anu, and they said, well, we'll solve the problem. We'll create Enkidu, which was this cloned uh, duplicate of the king, he, he just in the face. The rest of his body was as strong, and he was hairy, like the uh, Homo erectus that he was made from. But he was a distraction that got the king out of Europe and on adventure. And it's, it's really the first action hero story, if you read it, uh, the way I've read it. And the way my wife and I, we wrote the, the screenplay, Gilgamesh 10, which will be the foundation for a film if we ever get it made. With um, the, the reason why I bring up Gilgamesh um, and a possible dating of the story, and I didn't know if uh, you and... And, and Zechariah had talked about it, but are we uh, are we talking maybe a quarter of a million years? Are we talking well, four hundred no thousand years? Okay, it's possible that this story was a word of mouth message to the future. In other words, they always did things. I think in a way, the I'm talking about the Anunnaki, right? So that we would eventually discover what what it was and, and learn as we progressed in our own civilization. I think the Nazca. Lines are another example of, of a technology that was given to us in the form that we would only see when we started to fly. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, biomorph there is the hummingbird, which can't fly. You know, hummingbirds are not supposed to fly. Right. But that was the, and it was on a leveled plateau, again, a power beam leveled plateau. But back to the author, there is no credit given to who wrote this story. And I think it was word of mouth, a story that was told to the uh, scribes in in uh, Samaria, and eventually got written down, and then translated into the languages that came after it, Arcadian and uh, Babylonian, etc. And that the original story, uh, nobody's given credit. We don't know who the author was, but it must have been around for quite a while before it got written into the cuneiform tablets, in the twelve tablets. And I believe 
that it was another technological transfer saying to us, if you believe this story, one day you guys are going to clone things and you're going to have power beams and you're going to know really what happened, the story of the Great Flood. And it appears in the Bible, the Noah story in the Bible is kind of an adaptation of the Gilgamesh story. It's not the, the original story. And I, I reproduce that in the book Gilgamesh 10 so that folks that are interested in, in what the cuneiform tablets say the story of the Great Flood was, is that's the part of, of Gilgamesh I find fascinating and exciting. Now, with uh, let's talk about the time the timetable. Uh, let I want to start back at the beginning a little bit. Um, and, okay. Uh, what year? And I know that we're the. Okay, let, let me speak uh, simply here. We have the three thousand BC timetable always thrown around for the Anunnaki, and well, I, certainly with uh, Sumerian inventions when everything hit is mm-hmm. that is that when the um anunnaki was um still influencing yeah well uh, actually the story that i have you know the one that i i researched from many other sources to find out is that they, they touched down on planet earth maybe four hundred thousand years ago jimmy exactly and that's what that, that's exactly what what i want to uh, let's just lay this out okay between four hundred thousand years ago and Three thousand years ago, were they here the entire time? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, the- I believe. I believe. And I'm saying yes, but you know, in my core, uh, the evidence is that they were sort of immortal. They had figured out their uh, immune system such that the diseases didn't attack them, and that they were they aged. In fact, they aged more rapidly here in our environment than they supposedly did on their home planet. But we see pictures of them in the cylinder seals. <clears throat> I think those are self-portraits of, of the Anunnaki. They are robed men with beards, long beards, big noses, big ears, and horned helmets on their uh, heads and, and uh, high heel shoes on their feet. Anyway, I think that the um, uh, story of what happened before the flood? There's two time frames. There's, uh, you know, the olden times, which is the history of the Anunnaki from 400,000 years forward until uh, 200,000, maybe 200, 250,000 years ago. They have the skeletal remains of us, Homo sapiens, arriving, humans arriving uh, in Southeast Africa. So it took maybe 200,000 years of them being here alone. They couldn't talk to uh, Homo erectus. They couldn't use them as a workforce because they couldn't communicate with them, and they were dumb. So the uh, answer to the, uh, the story is that there was a mutiny in their mining operations. It's very difficult mining in South Africa. It's way down deep, and it's hot, and it's dirty. And, and so their heroes uh, supposedly uh, had a mutiny, and they said they weren't going to dig the gold anymore, and et cetera, et cetera. So the solution was... Enki said, I can create a primitive worker from the local species that will do our work for us. And that's uh, where the story of, of where humans came from. It's a fascinating another story. That's in my first book, too. With, uh, with uh, Nibiru coming by every 3,600 years, yes. were they... Um, uh, were they going up and meeting the planet and dropping off, you know, their their mind uh, gold? gold? No. Well, here's here's what I, I figured out. Since we've just entered our space age and we've created a space station, a small space station up above <clears throat> planet Earth, I think they had a mothership, a huge, huge mothership which orbited Earth, and that was their base. They could come to that base and, and have all their equipment and their uh, necessities and then they'd come down and do the work on the planet, and that they didn't need Nibiru. They would get supplies from Nibiru. It took a long time to get stuff from the home planet back to the mothership. But they talked about Mars being a way station, that they created a way station on Mars when it had water. Mars originally was an was atmosphere planet with water on it. Who is they? And wait, wait. Ho- I, uh, who said Mars was a way station? The translations that I've read uh, from uh, Zachariah Sitchin, okay, uh, he he's the one that uh, I'm quoting. I'm not saying that I don't, you know, I don't know this stuff. I'm just repeating what. what no, absolutely, absolutely. I just want to be clear. And, uh, that's all. And 
there is proof now that uh, the scientists have finally come around to the collision theory of Earth, that Earth was whacked. There's a cover on uh, National Geographic that I kept uh, from a couple of months ago that the scientific community finally fesses up to the collision, which Zachariah wrote about in 1974 in his first book, The Twelfth Planet, when he when he translated the uh, Numa Elish, which was the seven days of creation, the story was of the uh, entrance of Nibiru being captured by Neptune's uh, gravitational field. It was a free-floating planet out in space, got caught in our net, came in clockwise and whacked. It's one of its moons whacked Tiamat, which was the fourth planet, cut it in half practically, and the Pacific Ocean is the hole, and then went back out and came back again, and it seeded DNA onto our planet with this collision. Now, most of the scientific community wasn't fessing up to any kind of collision until just recently. Right. So I find that very interesting, uh, corroborating what Sitchin translated in Enuma Elish, which was the seven days of creation story. It was a cosmology that uh, took a lot of talent to figure out what was what. I, the first, first time I read it, I was I was lost, totally lost in the translation. Now, with uh, where is where is Planet X right now? Do you have uh, what's your theory on that? Is yeah, it- well, <clears throat> Sitchin and I agree. We talked about that a lot. And I did the math, and he did the math, and we think it's maybe 1,600 years out. That its last pass was around the year zero. There's the story of the Star of Bethlehem, which nobody's really ever explained what the Star of Bethlehem was. And the Romans were the only civilization that didn't record its passing. Now, the Greeks recorded it, the Indians, the Hindus recorded it, the Babylonians recorded it, the Hebrews recorded it, and the Samarians recorded it. So that we have a lengthy history of people having experienced, civilizations having experienced the passing of this planet X through our solar system. And it causes all kinds of of trouble because of its gravitational effect on our planet. In fact, the the Greeks named it Nemesis, (laughs) which I think is a a classic description of something that causes volcanic eruptions and tidal waves and so forth. But the whole story is, is, is an amazing story. And as I said, I'm sort of a, a research reporter, investigator, who's taking uh, a former scholar, Zachariah Sitchin's work, and uh, trying to explain it in my books. And then I've gone outside the envelope with my washboard gold mining theory and with the golden fleece and with several other things that I'll be talking about in my next book, uh, which I think is the only way you can collaborate the story. Of the, of the translations. The only way I believe the translations is if there's physical evidence here on the planet that you can touch, feel, kick, and examine and say, well, wow, who did that? You know, with, like you, what you said. Yeah. <laughs> with, um, uh, oh, you know what, let me get back to some questions here. I'm reading these and trying to talk at the same time, and I can't do that. So let's backpedal a, a little bit. And the first question in is, Oh, do you uh, know what's underneath the Sphinx, and is it the Hall of Records? Ah, good question. Whoever has done his homework on that, there has been evidence. Uh, some of your guests have talked about that there were uh, uh, some ground radar tests done that they proved that there are chambers underneath the, the Sphinx and then elsewhere, and, of course, the Egyptians kicked them out. They didn't want that being discovered. So it's very possible that there is a, a chamber under the Sphinx, and it may contain a whole bunch of information that would be very helpful. But I think the Egyptians are trying to preserve their story that they did it, and they don't want to have anybody saying that they didn't do it. And that would maybe prove something dramatic that would uh, blow their, their theories all to the winds. Um, one of the things that... I think now is starting to be uh, discussed, and I'm a I'm a definite spokesman for this, and I'll stand up on a soapbox and preach it all the time. I really think that civilization here has has been very, very, very cyclical. Um, it's very, very possible, and I and I strongly suggest that you know, and especially when you're going back four hundred thousand years with the Anunnaki yeah. that. That we we've probably come and gone a few times. I agree with you. And There's with, evidence of the, of regression. The fact that when they weren't here helping, you see the story of the flood as it's told in uh, Gilgamesh, 
is that they needed help. Can you can imagine uh, humans trying to survive on a planet that's got 10 miles thick of mud, and there's no food, and there's no there's no animals. There's none. So the story in Gilgamesh is that they helped humans survive by bringing uh, shepherding down from their mothership, and they brought uh, domesticated wheat and taught them how to farm, gave them a plow and all this technology transfer which helped us survive then if they went away for a while they said they were gone for 60 70 thousand years or they weren't helping we tend to regress right i agree with you in your theory we just go backwards and that um we see we have evidence of of, uh, civilizations on this planet that have been isolated in new guinea and so forth where they never got further than just hunter gathering and, and surviving they never got technical because they didn't have any need to, and nobody gave them any technology. Yeah, there's a there's an island off of India right now that is completely isolated, and yes. uh, I can't think of the name. Do you, uh, it? Yeah, I've got it somewhere in my files. I did. I was going to do a story on it. There are a bunch of pygmies there. Right, and and the Indian government does not allow any right. contact on that island no modern exactly. anything can go there and visit they don't want them if, and you're absolutely right it's not like they're uh you know they're driving cars and have steam no, engines and stuff. there's no need to get to where we are unless we're given the technology to do it and that's why i'm amazed that uh, uh the germans got as far as they did ahead of us i mean we were as smart as they were they must have been given technology from some other place advanced technology to have developed the weapons that they had what? way ahead of us you know, it, I, the question is so simple. If if we hadn't have gotten Einstein, uh, you know, right. if we, if we hadn't have gotten him, <laughs> if he hadn't have left, we wouldn't have the bomb. Yeah, we would be really backwards right now, right? They were doing heavy water experiments in Norway, and they would have got the bomb ahead of us, except Hitler screwed it up. Which is fortunate for us. We'd all be speaking German if that didn't happen. Jimmy. Well, I, I didn't want to say it, but you did. And, you know, that was, again, it's called synchronicity. With um, Do you have any ideas with uh, the 1,600 years that you were talking about uh, with the uh, with the orbit right now? Do you have any idea on coordinates? And do you think it has any relation with all of these new objects that they're finding outside of Pluto and outside of our solar system? Oh, well, I think we're discovering the exterior of our particular solar system. In other words, the early uh, people who, who wrote about uh, could only see five planets. In other words, with their naked eye, you can see Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, and, and uh, I guess those are the five. And the, the thing that really blew my mind was that the translation that Zachariah did of the cuneiform tablets talked about ten planets. And so how would they know? You know, humans couldn't have seen these planets. We didn't see Pluto until 1930. Right. And uh, so I think that to answer the question, uh, it's inward-bound cycle if indeed the Romans never recorded uh, the passing of it and then there was this star in the sky, which they uh, call the star of Bethlehem, if that was indeed the cycle, then 3,600 years it'll be back, and that means we're at 2014 now, so we've got about 1,600 years left before it comes through. But it doesn't mean that the Anunnaki cannot come back whenever they want to, Jimmy. I've figured out that when they left our planet on the mothership, they took off and are orbiting around maybe Mercury or some other nearby planet waiting to come back whenever they want to i have a theory that i have some pictures uh are you near a computer yes okay then i'm going to ask my producers to put up the uh the soho pictures soho one and two uh i've got uh, some pictures uh that a friend of mine has posted up with the um uh it, it looks it looks exactly like what the winged gods that that are represented in all of their carving coming around the sun yeah. and uh you know what i'm going to email these really quick to my producer if they don't have them but they should be uh they should be in the files it's called soho one and soho two if you could put those up as a church rant and i want 
uh, Marshall to take a look at those. Uh, pretty fascinating. How do I how do I see them on your website? Uh, the, the, as soon as they let me know that they're up, uh, I will uh, let you know. Uh, they should already be up. I just want them to let me know where they are, and then uh, and then we'll okay. get them up. Also, that, all I've got on your webpage right now is the show show schedules. Yeah, so if you scroll down below that, you'll see yeah. right below the show oh, schedule. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's called Church Rant. Rant 10, yeah. Okay. Now, um, I want you to look at these. Uh, were you listening to the show before you came on tonight? Yes, a little bit. Okay. Um, when I was talking about these, uh, the undersea uh, entrance to the base... Yeah. Um, off where, of the, where were these pictures taken? I mean, uh, these? No, 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 no. These weren't taken. These, this is Google Earth. Oh, this friend. is Google Earth. Oh, in yeah. Antarctica? Uh, no, this is off of. Uh, no, no, no. These here. These. This is the coast of Malibu. Malibu. That's right. Now, wow. this is what's interesting about this. When you're talking about undersea stuff going on down in Antarctica. Um, here, this for the first time, uh, this is uh, this is done with a couple of listeners here and a couple of friends of mine. We've done some investigation. I'm going to post everything tomorrow, and I, I already talked about this earlier on in the show, so I don't want to repeat myself. But I want your opinion. Now, when you look at these three pictures here, okay, the picture on the left. Now, everybody, go back to JimmyChurchRadio.com and go down to Church Rant so you can understand and follow. Uh, the questions that I'm about to ask uh, Marshall now. Picture number one on the left. Okay, open that yep. up. That's the right. coast of California. You can see right. Malibu. You can see Point Magoo. You can see Point Winema, the Marine right. Air Station, right? Right. Okay, right. now see that spot right in the middle, that nice little circle right in the middle yeah. of everything. That yeah. is uh, a couple of miles across by a couple of miles tall. Um, wow. I actually have the dimensions here. Now, go to the, close that picture out, go to the middle picture, and now this is an enlargement of that one. Now you're looking yeah. at the uh, total artificial shape. You can see that if you go around the perimeter, it's actually a rectangle, and then you have this round oval-shaped object in the center. Again, this is yeah. two yeah. and a half miles across, mile and a half tall, um, but look at the surroundings. Look at uh, look at the picture and look at the underwater coastline. Yeah. And this yeah. thing is sticking out like a sore thumb. Again, this is Google. This is not some yeah, Photoshop ma manipulation. No. Okay. Now, right. if you go to the third picture, this is a yeah. sideways view of the, the entrance. That's the entrance. Look at the columns. Yeah. Look at yeah. the support. So amazing. Amazing. That is absolutely amazing. And not only that, Marshall, and I want your comments, but that is obviously a thick, protected roof. Yep. That's yep. Doesn't it remind you of any other military installation that has that bomb-proof, nuclear-proof yep. roof on the yep. top of it? How thick do you think that is? That's a couple of hundred feet. Wow. Yeah, that's... And do they know what the uh, composition of the uh, underwater, is that rock? Well, see, we're working on this right now. I don't want to give away anything uh, too too much now until I publish uh, everything with, uh, with my other friends tomorrow and we get this out there. Uh, but th it is, it is. It's potentially very, very, very explosive. Now, this is yeah. my point. Right behind, uh, you're still looking at the sideways yeah. view, right? Okay, right. right behind it, that's Point Magoo. And then you have Point 1MA, or Port 1MA, uh, just up the coast. You know the okay. coast. You know where we're talking about. That is all restricted water behind here. You can't you're swim. Kidding. No, 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 no. It's like Area 51. You oh can't swim. You can't, uh, you can't enter the water. And there's reasons for that. And, and, you know, and when you look at this, it is obviously big enough for a submarine. It's big Absolutely. enough. For, it's big enough for a USO. And, yep. and that, if, if that's artificial, I'll eat my shirt. If somebody can I prove agree. to me I that agree. that it, is. It looks to me like it's, it's, it's uh, fabricated. And it's it, a fabricated structure. Yes. And I think it's this a, is, I think this is, 
for all of the, and you've heard this, you've been in California forever, okay? You went to Caltech in 1947. Right. You've been hearing the same UFO reports off of Malibu right. for for decades and decades and decades. And, and yeah. you would hear these reports, and I'm sure you can share some with us, about, you know, these underwater USOs coming out of of Malibu. And you hear these, it seems like almost weekly here in California, and everybody just blew it off. Well, now, here you go. What do you think? What well, do you think, Marshall? I'm, I'm, I'm blown away, Jimmy. I'm blown away by what you're showing me because I know there were underwater bases in the Antarctica that, the, uh, that I think Marduk had and that uh, the UFOs that came in the TAC Task Force 68 came from under the water, the USOs. And there was a base under the Antarctic, and the, the Germans knew about it. And I think the Germans might have had interface with them. And uh, they, they, if they wanted to de destroy us, they could have sunk all those ships and killed everybody. They didn't. They just did enough damage to turn it around and send it home. They right. didn't want them poking around there. Right, right. And I know it wasn't the Germans, because they loved, the war, war ended in 1945. Right. And this was in uh, February of 1947. I'm I'm waiting to see if uh, uh, the uh, we've got these other pictures posted up here yet. It's uh, called Soho One and Soho Two. I do believe. Let's see if they're up yet. Okay, they're not up, but uh, we'll we'll get them up here shortly. And it is a picture of, and the best way to explain it is from the Soho satellite. And when you look, it it's of the sun. And plain as day, coming around, there's one picture before and one picture after. And mm -hmm. let's see here. Hold on. Let me go. What were the pictures taken with? Uh, you know? the, the, the Soho satellite. Oh, Soho. Okay. That's, that's good. Okay. I have them here. I'm going to uh, – I've got them. Okay. You know what? Uh, I would almost want to take a break. You know what? I'm not going to take a break. Let's just – I'm going to do this in real time. This is how we do it here. I'm going to email and and get this out to our producers. I don't know why they can't find them. But you know what? Let's just do this in real time. Church rant number two. Yes. Add attachment. And this is how we do it here. <laughs> this is so funny. Okay. Uh, Soho. And these are some of the the most fascinating picks that that I have seen in a while, and and I immediately had them posted up here. And uh, the research. I agree with you, Jimmy. That, that's something that needs to be investigated. But if you can't get there, if they've restricted the area, how can you get close enough to find out? Right, right. Please post. Um, I'm what I want to do, and I think this is the best uh, way to get this done. Is you go down there and you just get arrested. Go down there and <laughs> and I like your style. Myself. Well, that's 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 the best way to do it. Just go down, get arrested. Um, when there was a there was a site here uh, out out very close to you actually, where they were proposing to build uh, the new. NFL arena, uh, the, the stadium, right? So yeah. I go out with my uh, my friend. We've got video cameras and we've got pic uh, 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 digital cameras. We pull up and we break in. We, we go through <laughs> the construction. We get stopped by a park ranger. What mm -hmm. are you doing out here? And we tell him. And he goes, oh, okay, well, they're going to build the stadium here. They're going to, the new shopping center is going over there. The hotels are going, and we're videotaping. And that's the point. You know, I wanted to know where this new stadium was being built. And so I went out there and I wanted to, because if you're not getting arrested, then there's anybody can go there. There's no cover up. Mm -hmm. But if you go down to this, this part of PCH where this underground undersea entrance is, go down there, cause some trouble, videotape, jump in the water. Pull right. the police out and let them talk to you. Get arrested or at least get detained, <laughs> you know, and that's, yeah. and that's how you get it done. And I, the same thing with Area 51. That's what you do. Go out there and stir the hornet's nest. 
you, you know, you've got to you got to poke a stick in there. Yeah. And well, I'm I'm interested in uh, the physical nature of our planet and things that are here that you can touch, feel, and examine, and then tie it together, connect the dots, as I say. And if there's enough physical evidence, this would be a very significant find, Jimmy. Very I, I, I think so too. And and there's there's uh, there's a reason why it hasn't been found yet. And and but you know what we did we found it, um, and the credit doesn't go to me. It goes to Marshall and and Dale Romero and uh, and a couple of other guys that have that I can't say their names out out loud yet. Okay. But but okay. this information came to us and, and it came to us in a flood over the last two days. And rather than sit on it. I just decided to, and that's where I will take the credit. I want it out there. I want answers. I want, right, you know, right. and well, that's what you do, Jimmy. That's what you do. Well, you can't stop the internet, Marshall. You know that it's sure. a tidal wave, and you s you you send it out there, and one person, the next thing you know, everybody's talking about it, and then uh, I'll I'll take the repercussions. You know, let let somebody come down on me. You get the arrows. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the arrows. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I got a, a quick question that just came in. It says, sorry if it's been asked. I've just tuned in. Um, uh, oh, they're on the East Coast. Any thoughts on the copper-handled door Zahi Hawass found 208 yeah. feet under the pyramid? Yeah. No, that's just another piece of technology that is unexplainable. There are things that I don't have uh, answers for. I mean, there are curiosities. There are things that shouldn't be there. Uh, I found temples with doors with no hinges, no handles, and no bolts. Uh, these are things you can't explain, and I, I hate to speculate without having some real concrete... Uh, I think they, they drilled a hole through that door, too. Oh, he, I, oh he's referring to uh, Gatenbrink's door. Uh, that's what he's referring to. Okay, oh, not, I, the, not the shaft in the pyramid. Yeah, that that, that was called Gatenbrink Store, the original German uh, researcher that was there. Yeah, they took the robot and went right. the shaft. Right, right, yeah. right. So, so they, they drilled a hole through that door. I know that, and they stuck a camera in there, and they found another chamber. Right, <laughs> <laughs> and it dropped off, so they couldn't. But didn't they? They found a second door. Didn't they find a door behind the door? Uh, I believe, that could be. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not there. I can't do what they're doing. I hope that they would report on what they find, and it would add to the pieces of the puzzle. The puzzle is enormous, and all the pieces have to fit together to make sense. And I'm doing my little bit over here in my corner of the things that I've recently, you know, uh, in the new book I'll be talking about uh, the things the Romans didn't build that they got credit for. <laughs> I've, I've analyzed them and I found that the, the Romans certainly couldn't have built them but anyway that's another story and these are all pieces of the puzzle that add credibility to the uh, the story of the history of the Anunnaki and I think we need to face up to these uh, truths in order to set ourselves free you cannot live in a, in a shadow in the darkness and not have the knowledge and I'm uh, as a Caltech graduate uh, been taught Find out the truth. Hey, here's another quick question while I'm waiting for these Anunnaki uh, pictures to get posted. Uh, Jimmy, and I was going to ask you this earlier, by the way, um, and so this is a very direct question. There's so much gold in the universe. It exists on asteroids, other planets, stars, etc. Why bother coming to Earth to mine it? It's the well, they were captured into our solar system. In other words, they, they apparently did some kind of a survey of all the other planets and as far as technically being able to retrieve gold, we were a friendly environment, and we had a lot of gold. They didn't have gold on their planet, not much. And they did this sort of survey of all the other planets, and um, ours was the one that, that rang the bell, so they came here. With um, I, with uh, Zechariah's explanation of uh, the atmosphere, uh, how, how was it used? Uh, you know, was it... Was it spun? Was it turned into powder? I mean, how did they use it oh, okay. in the they, atmosphere? They had a, have an atmosphere like we do. You know, They couldn't survive in, in the orbit. Their 3,600-year orbit takes them way past Pluto into the nether regions of our solar system where it's colder than hell. They're not near the sun. And the only thing that keeps them surviving is their atmosphere. 
Well, they did the same thing we've done. They created what's called an ozone leak. And we have it on our planet. And our, if you don't close the ozone leak, your atmosphere is going to be sucked right out through it. So they tried all kinds of things according to the translations by Zachariah. And the only thing that they found that would work, which would help heal it, was to put flakes of gold, which reflect the sun, and uh, would eventually allow the ozone leak to heal itself. Now, if we get into trouble, eventually we can't close our ozone leak. I would suggest strongly that we follow <laughs> that path. We've got the gold, and we could certainly uh, flake it up and distribute it into the ozone leak and, and heal it, because that's what they did. And, and they're smarter than we are, uh, Jimmy. They're about a million years more advanced than we are. Was it? Uh, were they? Um, uh, how's the? What's the word I want to use? What, was it transparent? I mean, how did? And this is this is the other thing that uh, I need you to ask a answer directly. With with uh, Nibiru going so far outside of the solar system, how how did they stay warm? As okay. it left, as well, it look left at, the look sun. Look at our spaceships. You know, we build uh, the shuttles and all the uh, space station. is is pretty cold outside the space station, but we can build artificial atmospheres inside. Their their natural atmosphere protected the planet. They had internal heat from uh, like volcanoes, like we have, and the volcanoes kept their their internal climate uh, habitable. But the protection that they had was their atmosphere. And if they lost their atmosphere, they'd become a barren planet like Mars. Mars had an atmosphere, apparently, early on, and it had water. And something, uh, you know, maybe the passing of Nibiru wiped out uh, Mars's water and, and atmosphere and became a red, dry planet. But uh, the story that uh, is written, apparently, in the translations, as near as I can tell, were that they were going to... Uh, lose their atmosphere and therefore lose their civilization unless they close the ozone leak in their atmosphere. And that's what is like if we punctured a hole in our one of our space station uh, in the space station or in uh, uh, the shuttlecraft, you, you got real problems. So the protective shield. And by the way, we use gold on the visors of our our spacesuits and also on top of the uh, satellites we put up to reflect the sun and to keep the temperatures. Uh, doable on the, the artificial machinery that we send up. Gold is a very, very good uh, reflector of sunlight and insulator. So now, I'm sure they had other uses for it besides uh, closing the leak, and I'm sure that the amount of gold that was taken from our planet was used for, for other things. And my question to Zachariah was, how about white powder gold? He wouldn't, he wouldn't give me an inch on that one. Well... Gold, there, there is no gold that is that is naturally produced on Earth. All the gold that is here has been brought here from some somewhere else, asteroids or something. Well, the is, chemical composition of the planet is multitudinous. All kinds of things. Were, we were bombarded by everything before we became what we see today, and protect, particularly the uh, hole in the Pacific. If you drain the water out of the Pacific Ocean, you've got a planet that's it's half there. Yeah, right, and, uh, right, 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 right. Okay, uh, now here's so here's my... Hit, maybe the gold came from outside, but in order to mine it, it has to be in veins that are accessible or the water, placer water that's stripping, naturally stripping the gold uh, from the veins. And uh, apparently, somehow with their technology, they were able to uh, uh, pinpoint planet Earth as the place they had to come to, and that's why they came here. That's uh, the story. Here's my gift to you. Okay, refresh jimmychurchradio.com. Refresh the okay. page, reload it. Right. I love my producers here. They 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 don't think that I like them. They think that, you know, it's it's me against them, but they do stuff oh, like Oh wow. Okay. Wow. Okay, so now exactly. So what yeah, I want I see it. Yep. Yeah. 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 Now click on the last picture all the way to the right. I want you to do that one first because it's a great enlargement. Now, this is non-Photoshop. This is not nothing. This is the direct. This is um, on the NASA website. You can see mm -hmm. when the picture was taken. Yeah. And yeah, it's two thousand. Yeah, it's 2001. Right. And it's 719 in the evening. 
and there you go. And there it yeah. is flying it's around huge, the sun. It's a it's, huge ship. It's huge. That's, I mean, if you know how big the sun is and you take that in proportion to it, right. that's a monster. Right. Now, monster when, ship. when you look and at... And, you know, there were, NASA published some other pictures in December of last year, Jimmy. I don't know if you saw it. They were photographing um, Mercury. Right. Because the sun was erupting. There was a solar flare, and it illuminated it, and it showed something just like this and, orbiting... Mercury, and they covered it up. They said, "Oh, it was shadows and so forth." And so there are right. another picture. Yes, and the, and the thing is, not only with those pictures, but with this one here, before somebody says, "Oh, it's pixelated." Well, no, it's not, because if you look at the sparks coming off of the back of the ship, you yeah. can see the size of the pixelation there. All versus, right, I have a question for you, Jim. Yes, if they're that close to the sun. What kind of technology is on the skin of that ship that keeps them from frying? <laughs> yeah, it, it, totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to get that close to our star, uh, you've got to have some advanced technology that would survive the environment that you're entering into. Yes. And, and, and you have to think about Mercury. I've often thought many times, why doesn't Mercury just burn up and melt and disappear? But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not impossible. And you're absolutely right. Is this ship made out of diamond? It's white. You can look at it and see that it's white. And it's an amazing uh, picture. It's absolutely. an amazing picture. And it's one that you just cannot explain away. I don't want to hear from a debunker. It's this, it's that. No, 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 no. I want something yeah, a little yeah. bit more simple. Well, we know, we know from the story of Gilgamesh, uh, Jimmy, that they had a mothership because it's in there. They, that's where they, uh, they went to. Anu hung out on the mothership and allowed the, his uh, sons and his granddaughter to uh, take over the affairs on Earth. But there were stories in Gilgamesh of them going back to the mothership to get in contact with Anu. And Gilgamesh's goal, his mother told him, uh, Queen Nissan, that if he wanted immortality, the only person he could get it from was Anu, and he had to go up in a Shem to the to the mothership to meet with him. And he went to the landing platform uh, to talk to the uh, Shamash, who was the uh, twin, Ishtar's twin brother. And he was in charge of the landing platform, and he said, no way, you know, there's no way you're going to... Uh, take a Shem, which is a rocket ship from here up to, to Nanu. It's just, it's impossible. Forget about it. Do something else. So the whole story of, of Gilgamesh's search for immortality makes up the epic. And it's a fascinating uh, lesson for us, and I think it'll make a great movie. Oh, it's going to be a great movie. Um, and what do you think about uh, the shape of this ship in this picture? Doesn't it look very... An Anunnaki ish, if there's such well, a word. Well, you know, we've never we've never seen any depictions of their 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 craft, their their spaceships. They, I mean, they talked about them, and there were silos. There were some pictures in uh, uh, cylinder seals that they were in silos and they had pointed noses. But their technology was so much more advanced than ours, Jimmy. That it's you just have to let your imagination run wild as to what they could have built, what they could have conceived. But this, if you take the Earth, Earth is smaller in comparison to the sun than the ship. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. take a look at a comparison of the physical side of Earth yes. next to the sun. It's smaller than that ship. And that's why uh, somebody just posted, uh, I don't know who it was, I just read it really quick, that it could have been a meteorite exploding and spreading no. apart. I, I yeah the the, it, the fact that the, there's some kind of propulsion or something coming off of yeah. the back of this it's right. in the center um the entire thing is is symmetrical but it's not symmetrical in that it's not some photo anomaly that would be totally symmetrical it's not symmetrical yeah. and so i don't know how to when my brain looks at this and my eyes are trying to make sense of what i'm looking at yeah. Well, you have to really think outside the box again as to what technology could be. How big could they build something that would uh, be a, a total civilization inside of it? Right, right. Well, it, it always reminds me of when I, when I think of something like that with uh, you know the way that Arthur C. Clarke presented uh, the visitation. Uh, it's called a, a Rama, you know, his Rama series of books. Yes. And 
that ship was, you know, it was literally another world. It had cities right. in it. It was run by robots, and mm-hmm. you couldn't. It had atmosphere. Um, it went from one side of, of you know, it's just absolutely huge cities. Well, it's kind of like the, the, the Lucas depicted in the Death Star. Exactly and, right. It's exactly you know, right. That, that thing was humongous. Well, and that's what you would have to do if you're going to go across the universe in a in a conventional sense. You have to be you, self-contained. You, you have, have to, to be so, everything. That's exactly right. You would have to be self-contained, and you would have to have uh, civilization on board and reproduce for tens of thousands of years. That's right. You know, I had re- I read the other day, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for light to travel from one side of our Milky Way to the other, it's 10,000 years. Is that right? That's light years, yeah. That's how they measure distances. Astronomical distance are are calculated by the speed of light and the length of time it would take for a beam of light to travel that distance at that 186,000 or million miles per second. Right. Whatever it is, I so forget. But it, you're right. No, everything in the astronomical world is done in light years. So, and but one it's, light year is a distance that light will travel at that speed in one one of our years. I mean, our so, so year, ten thousand ten thousand years, not ten thousand light years, but ten thousand years to go from one side of the Milky Way to the other. Yeah, that's how long it would take light to travel. So, if you're the only way I can put my mind around that is think about that for us to build a space, you know, some kind of star craft to to travel across. We're talking. Yeah. 10,000 well, years of One of the first of this... questions that comes to your mind, I'm sure, Jimmy, is how the people could survive that length of time. How could humans live that long? And there's a very interesting story out of San Francisco of a gal scientist who's doing experiments with worms. Have you read about that? No, I haven't. What is it? She took two sets of worms and she found the what she called was the, um, the Grim Reaper gene. And she turned off the Grim Reaper gene in one set of uh, worms and not in the other, and that they live 10 times longer. And she extrapolated that if we could find the death or the uh, Grim Reaper gene in our DNA system and turn it off, uh, life capac- lifespan of humans could go up to 500 years. So that's small compared to the Anunnaki's lifespan, but it's a certain a giant leap in the tinkering with our DNA to prolong our lives. It, uh, it's eventually going to happen. You know, we're just in the baby steps of our space age and uh the warning that Feynman told me back in the original quote i gave you about ufos he said if any of them survive their space age they could have visited us well th- we need to figure out how to survive our space age because we've got atomic weapons we've got the rockets and we've got the ability to destroy ourselves i have seen that this is a email that just came in i have seen the ancient batteries found in egypt they look very simplistic. What? Why do you think we haven't found any plastics or metals uh, like titanium? Surely they must have brought equipment down from their ships. Yeah, well, we just haven't found it yet. So, or they were clever enough to remove it all, take it with them, stuff that they needed when they finally phased off the planet. I'm sure that they uh, didn't leave any things like we leave in Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, we're not technically advanced enough to retrieve all that stuff. Right. But, they, you know, you're talking about a civilization that perhaps is a million years more advanced than we are, and it's, it's incredible to figure out what technology they've, they've evolved into. When you hang out... When you hang out with your friends, Marshall, all of your Caltech buddies and, you know, all of you, you know, guys that are a lot. They're all dead. (laughs) All those guys that are a lot smarter than I am. Do you you guys sit around and and talk about this or are you like the weird guy in the room? I'm the woo-woo. You are? Yeah. No, they're scientists. They're engineers and scientists and they have not uh, come to the world that I accept what I accept as, as reality. And, uh, you know, they raise their eyebrows, and uh, I've been called woo-woo lots of times, but it doesn't bother me. Uh, I just uh, seek what the truth is for myself, and then I share it in my books with the people who are interested in making up their own mind about what the true story of humans are. The subtitle of my first book, Adam the Missing Link, by the way, is The New History of Mankind's Creation. 
And that, if you put that on your coffee table and your guests come over and they look at this book, Adam, The Missing Link, and The New History of Mankind's Creation, it starts all kinds of conversations. <laughs> well, uh, now, before I let you go, and I'm going to talk you into an extra 10 minutes anyway, if you don't mind. And I know it's late, but I'm having a lot of fun, and I know that I, I think you are too. Okay. Uh, let's 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 back up a little bit and and uh, let's talk about the creation of man and DNA in the very beginning, where the, it's one of two things happen. It, it was either divine intervention or a yes. complete, an utter lucky accident. Well, look at it this way: if the story of the Anunnaki is true. If they were an advanced civilization that were capable of coming to our planet for the purposes that they stated, uh, then it would appear to me that we would have to ask the question, who created them? Where did they come from? In other words, they're, they're, they came and replicated something on, on our planet that maybe had happened to them millions of years ago, and maybe this thing in the universe is a continuing story, and maybe we were supposed to be uh, the next uh, species that would evolve if we could survive our space age into the high-tech uh, people like the Anunnaki, you realize that our, our star is doomed. Our planet Earth is going to go, uh, when the star goes supernova in like 50 billion years from now, we have to have a new place to habitat. We've got to find Earth too. So we're, our space age will evolve eventually into a exploration of the nearby solar systems or even further out to find earth too that we could start the whole thing over again on because the destiny of planet earth is to become a cinder when our star goes supernova well yeah we mars no mars is just a stopgap of like a couple of hundred years if we go and occupy them once it yeah, gets no, too that, hot that's here that's not going to save us no the no only survival we have uh, possibly is to get off our our home planet, and go find another habitable planet, which they're discovering lots of them now. In the new uh, search for extra planets in the nearby uh, solar systems has produced uh, a couple of, of objects that look pretty promising, and that'll be the goal of humanity. Humanity's destiny, if, if, if we have a destiny, Jimmy, is to leave Earth and carry the great experiment forward on another Earth, too. That's my best uh, summation for you and and let's touch upon religion just a little bit is is uh the anunnaki is gilgamesh is gilgamesh our god no the anunnaki had a had a, a deity they called it the creator of all you see they ran into the same question that uh, i asked the linus pauling you know do you believe in god and he told me that, you know, he can explain everything scientifically back to the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, but that we didn't know what there was a millisecond before the Big Bang. So if you want to believe in God, please do. So um, I think that um, if the civilization is a million years more advanced than we are, and they still have a deity, the creator of all, which, by the way, in the story of Gilgamesh, uh, messages come to Enki on how to save humanity without breaking his oath. He was sworn to an oath not to su survive humanity. Uh, Enlil wanted to destroy us all. It's a fascinating story, and it's in the book Gilgamesh 10. And, it, uh, you know, the people who wrote the Bible had reference to these cuneiform tablets. There were libraries in Samaria that scholars went to, and just like the Library of Alexander, right. and they studied they studied the text and they saw these stories, but they couldn't understand it because it wasn't capable of their technology to understand. So the stories in the Bible are kind of uh, what they knew and what they could put together from the Epic of Gilgamesh as to how the flood happened and how Noah survived it. And that's where religion really gets going, is that there's answers that you cannot explain. Pauling cannot explain to me what there was a millisecond before the Big Bang. And I think that uh, since uh, we have evidence, I have evidence of a civilization that, say, is a million years more advanced than we are, and they have a deity called the creator of all. That makes sense to me. Is there, uh, is there a connection to uh, the, the channeling that, uh, that, that uh, a number of people are doing around the world and, and talking about you know, a ship that's being positioned outside of our atmosphere and 
and them representing is uh, a, you know a race, a galactic race. Is there any connection? Do you think uh, to the I can't Anunnaki? Speak to that. I can't speak to that, Jimmy, because I said I'm a three dimensional guy. Right. Uh, I, I don't uh, haven't had the experience of channeling. I, I have to take the word of what people tell me, but they can't prove to me with physical facts things I can put my hands on and touch, right. feel. And, Sure. Like a tire. Sure. Uh, my daughter, interestingly, Jen Clarfeld, who lives in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, is a multidimensional young woman who believes these things and, and uh, is a theta healer, and she gets into lots of discussions with me about it. But so far, I'm still living in a 3D world. What I, what what can't. dimension is she in? Fifth. She's in the fifth dimension? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she believes in the Palladians and the star people and... Uh, and the channeling. I mean, she does past life regressions. In other words, she gets a lot of her information from clients that come to her for hypnotherapy sessions. And um, she discovers these things by their past lives. And uh, so when you guys sit down and you guys talk, um, has she, uh, mm, have you ever asked her? She has her beliefs. Well, no, but I'm, I have I have mine, <laughs> and, and, and we we agreed to disagree. You know, I I have I'm a tire kicker. I need to have physical evidence of of these phenomenons, uh, you know, happening, and I haven't. So maybe one day I will. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll have that experience. But until I do, I can't talk about it. I can't tell you what what people say. What a what a pleasure I've had tonight. By the way, this is a uh, well. Ben thank you, Jimmy. It's been a pleasure for me too. And normally I don't go for two hours nonstop. <laughs> I told you today, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna go that way. Um, a couple of things really quick. So we have um, Adam the Missing Link dot com. That's your main site for yes, publishing. That's, that's the website. Yeah, there's two pages there. One is the story about how I did what I'm doing, and the second is a book page that has. All of my three books there, uh, in in many forms. You can get it as a hard copy. You can get it as an ebook, and you can get it as Kindle. And so before it's available. And before Pardon. anybody says anything about the fourth book uh, that uh, <laughs> that Marshall <laughs> mentioned earlier, that book is not out yet. I don't even think you have a title for it yet. But yes, I do. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you. It's called uh, Mysteries of Alien Technology. Okay, very cool. Oh, I like yeah, that. Yeah. I like that. I mean, it's, and it's got over 170 color pictures in it, and I get into all the new stuff that I've discovered. And I hope one day it may be a landmark uh, for some people who finally come around to realize that there is a lot of truth to what I've been reporting in my books. Well, I can't wait to read it. And, of course, you know, I'll have you back on the show when it comes out. But I'm assuming that when it does come out, you and I are going to be out uh, in Joshua Tree, Yes, and, uh, that's where I will be. And my lecture at Joshua Tree is based on the fourth book. Okay. so, so uh, And also I'm doing a workshop on Gilgamesh 10. So that, there's two chances to uh, to hear what I have to say about everything. And, and the, that, uh, that conference is called Contact in the Desert. And that's, Contact in the Desert. It's August the 8th through the 11th at Joshua Tree, which is about an hour north of where I live in at La Quinta. Yeah, it's going to be great. And we'll be broadcasting out there Friday night. And so I know that you'll well, be there. I'll see you then. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll get you on the air then, and we can talk about the book. And that's going to be an exciting conference. And I invite everybody to come out and meet Marshall. Uh, that weekend, we're going to have uh, uh, Van Donneken's going to be there. Um, George Sukalos, yeah, Giorgio, um, Greer, I mean, every, uh, Stephen it's Greer. Like, it's the Woodstock of the UFO. <laughs> That's the best way to put it, actually. <laughs> if you really want the the real stuff, and and can you imagine just walking around the hallways there at the uh, at the center, and just who's just going to be hanging out? It's going to be so much yeah, fun. Yeah. And, no, it's it's a very friendly environment, and and getting to meet and talk with these people, I enjoy it too because you know most of my contact with them has been. Uh, telephone conversations emails etc so 
once a year we get together and, and uh, it's fun. Yeah, it's I can't fun. I can't wait for it. So we'll get you on the air that Friday night when we broadcast from there. Contact good, in the Jimmy. Desert, August 8th. And thank you so much for the interview tonight. I appreciate the conversation. You're a very bright guy. Oh, I fake it. It's all smoke and mirrors. But thank you, oh, Marshall. No, come you've on. got <laughs> you've got the Caltech credentials. I went to Pasadena City College, okay? It's a it's a little Well, t- you know where the school is anyway. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Thank you, Marshall. Okay. You have a great rest of your week, and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Had a Bye-bye. great time. Marshall Klarfeld. Oh, my, my. Woo. Okay. With that, <laughs> folks, I am going to take a quick break, and uh, I will be back right after this. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. When I come back, your emails. Opening up the phone lines right now, 323-825-5045. Got a lot to talk about tonight. I'm going to take five. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us, everybody. KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com On the Dark Matter Radio Network Hey, this is Alan Johannes from the Vultures of Queens of the Stone Age. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Fade to Black, the Wednesday edition, Bell Gab. The Wednesday edition. KJCR. Got a bunch of email. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can also do it through the website. It all goes through the producers and gets to me. So I got some extra stuff here that's kind of hanging out there. Thank you, Marshall. And I don't want everybody to forget, man. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Dan Fogler in the house. Now, the thing is, what I need everybody to understand so you understand who is going to be here. Dan Fogler is the guy, the actor, from Balls of Fury and Fanboys. That's right. Hilarious guy. He's got a new movie out. It's called Don Peyote with our friend, Freeman is in the movie. Now, this is the deal. Before you say, you know, why isn't Freeman on the show? Everybody is on their way from the East Coast here. So they're doing this big, uh, 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 the the premiere for the movie, Don Peyote, is in Hollywood on Friday night. And it's going to be at uh, Cinema Arena Cinema in Hollywood, Friday night. Now, I'm going to be there. Now, the show, we're going live, obviously. We'll be live from here, 7 to 10 uh, p.m. I'm 10 minutes from Hollywood. So the second that the show is over, I go over the hill, and I pull into Hollywood to Arena Cinema. It's not, uh, the address is 1625 Las Palmas. And if you know Hollywood at all, you know that area. That's right there, Hollywood and Highland uh, in that uh, general vicinity right there. And so, uh, again, it is Arena Cinema. Now, back to Fogler. Fogler, 
uh, went through. This is what the movie is about. He plays this guy. His name is Warren Allman. And I'm not going to give the movie away, but it's about this movie is about us. I'm talking about me, you and everybody that is listening to this show right now. Everything is in this movie. After 9-11 happened, uh, Dan was in, I uh, was talking to Dan earlier today. Dan was in, in New York. He lives in New York. And uh, when 9-11 happened, he was watching out the window what's going on. He can see it. And he is listening to or has the TV on inside. And he's listening to the news get reported. And what he was seeing and what they were reporting were two different things. And they were reporting things on the TV that hadn't happened yet. For instance, they had said to him, and I'm not making this up, but he was uh, telling me the story today. I'm going to get him to talk about it live tomorrow. That he said that he's sitting there and they said that building number two is has come down but he's looking outside his window and it's still standing for a while. And that is when he had his aha moment. And that's when his life kind of changed. And that's when he jumped into not only conspiracies, but just other things out there that, that, you know, everything from ufology to, uh, 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 the conspiracy of 9/11 to Freemasonry, all the way, all the way the gamut to time travel, reptilians, uh, grays, abductions, everything. Because he had a few events that happened in his life, and so he just went back and rethought everything, and he jumps in onto the net, and that's where he finds Freeman, our friend. And if you haven't been to freemantv.com, go there. Check it out. That's Freeman. Freeman Fly. Freeman. So it, through his research for this idea for the movie for Don Peyote over the next few years, uh, he meets Freeman and watches his videos and listens to him. And also, you know, not, not only shows like this and Art Bell and and coast to coast, but everybody else out there too as well, Alex Jones. And he goes through, and this is a comedian, but he goes through and he finds this, he goes through this self-discovery. And that is what he has turned this movie into, Don Peyote. Now, this movie, Don Peyote, before you stop and think, oh, you know, go check it out right now on IMDb. Go watch the trailer right now. This movie has got a cast Anne Hathaway's in this movie. Topher Grace is in this movie. Josh Duhamel is in this movie. Love, Josh. Wallace Shawn is in this movie. And I can keep going on and on and on and on. It's got an excellent cast. Freeman plays himself. This is a serious, serious movie. And when you go and you watch the trailer and you see how it's done uh, and the way that Dan plays his role... Um, of uh well you know i'm not going to give it away i'm not going to give it away but the movie is absolutely just amazing so that's what's going on tomorrow and that's who's coming in to talk tomorrow dan uh is a very open-minded guy he knows a lot about a lot and he was telling me today he goes jimmy anything that you can think of anything that you talk about on your show anything anything that that freeman talk it's all in this movie because it's all important and self-discovery is important. And, uh, I, you know, I can see Dan becoming like the spokesman of us all out there. But I think this is one of those movies where we're kind of uh, thankful that somebody comes along and gets a movie like this made by a major motion picture company with, with a, you know, when you have somebody like, you know, Anne Hathaway and Topher Grace and Josh and Wallace. Wallace Shawn is the guy from Princess Bride. Inconceivable. That guy, Wallace Shawn, he's in this movie. You know, this is uh, a really, really cool flick. So that's, I, I really 
I'm only talking about this so much right now because I'm excited about Dan coming in here, somebody of his stature. Uh, the reason why I read the email earlier from from Ben when he says, you know, you, you know, you you talk about your friends in the music industry. Can you get people? Well, they, they this is an example of this tomorrow night. Dan Fogler coming in here to be open minded, and he's already let me know, Jimmy. I'm not going to watch my language, but I'll talk about anything. I said, you know what? All right, I'll green light that, and uh, and so that's it. I really tomorrow night, everybody needs to be here and focused and listen to uh, to Dan Fogler. Okay, with that, let me go through some emails really quick before we wrap this up tonight. Uh, Eugene says, Fogler is the man. Love him and fanboys. Absolutely. Super underrated movie by my friend Dana Brunetti. You're absolutely right. And, and well, you know what? Uh, uh, Balls of Fury, totally underrated. Uh, let's see. Kindly don't mention Over the Hill, please. I don't know what that means, Leslie, but I'm reading it live on the air. Uh, okay, so let me get to some emails. We got a bunch that I didn't get to tonight, and I apologize for all of that. So let's see what we have here. Uh, this is live on the air. Any option on those who attacked Bird? Oh, oh, any opinion? I'm sorry, on those who attacked Bird. Were they any uh, any difference of aliens than the Anunnaki? If so, would the Anunnaki intervene? Great question. Um, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to think, you know what? That's actually a really good question. And I'm sorry I didn't get that to, uh, to it in time, but, uh, I will forward this to Marshall. Uh, this one comes in deja vu. Hi, it just hit me. Cliff high is Alto Webbot report talked about a time loop experience like the one I just described and how those swept up in it involved and it would uh, not fair so well uh, when it was over. Deja vu. Read Cliff's report. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back and read this, Roger. I see that it's another email to everybody, uh, to Whitley. And, uh, oh, by the way, Whitley, I you know what? I want Whitley on the show next week. Uh, we just communicated back and forth, and we were picking dates. I didn't even think about that. Absolutely. We're going to get uh, Whitley Stryber in here uh uh, very soon. Uh, this comes in from Brad from KBS. Think the Dart Nike is a relic from the Anunnaki. Sorry about the spelling. No, you spelled it close enough. There's 15 ways to spell Anunnaki, by the way, and that is one of them. So very good. Don't worry about it, Brad. Um, and but besides, nobody saw it but me. Yes, I the the Dark Knights. The Dark Knight satellite, and the if if uh, you if you don't know what I'm talking about or what Brad is referencing, the Dark Knight satellite is something that was discovered in the early 30s, and uh, uh, by a, uh, a radio guy over in, and I believe it was Sweden, it may have been Holland, uh, picked up signals decoded the signals um uh uncoded decoded and and got a couple of messages back now i I don't have that in front of me i'm answering this email in real time this is live radio but the dark knight satellite that was the original uh that was the original finding of the dark knight satellite and then in the late 1950s we found it in a polar orbit. Now, we at the time, and again, this is just from my memory, and if I'm wrong, don't, don't crucify me, but I, I know that I'm close here. And the polar orbit was something that we hadn't figured out how to do yet. And it was, uh, you know, obviously it was in an orbit going around the opposite that we normally position satellites in for, for uh, traversing around the Earth. Well, then we went up and and it popped some photographs of it. And there was, there was some research done into it for this to be up there in a polar orbit. Then that would mean we have been uh, tracking everything up there as much as we can for a long time. And that placed the age of this satellite 
of around, and I'm going to guess here, I think it was 19,000 years. 12,000 years, 15,000 years, 19,000 years. That's what comes to mind right now. I don't have it up in front of me. But the photographs that were of the Dark Knight satellite, Black Knight satellite, Dark Knight satellite, NASA pulled down from their website this year. There was about, I've got some up of, of, of Dark Knight, and you can find, find some of it on the web. Uh, there's about 15 photographs that uh, the ISS and the space shuttles had taken of the Dark Knight satellite as it passed it. It's a pretty kooky-looking uh, satellite. I don't know what to, uh, to what to make of it and why the shape, you know, the reason, I don't know how to explain what it looks like, but it's uh, menacing is the, is, is the word that comes to play. It's black, and it looks very, very, very foreign. It's nothing that we put up there. There are some rumors out there, Brad. I remember a, a couple couple of years ago when I researched a Dark Knight originally uh, that it was a seat from the space shuttle that somehow this is the explanation that you know NASA wants to give you. Uh, it's a seat or a seat cover, a seat cushion from the space shuttle or from ISS somehow got ejected and, and is out there in Earth's orbit, and that's what you're looking at. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like a seat. And that would also mean something that was four feet across. And when you look at, you know, four or five feet long, when you look at these pictures, it's obvious that this thing is huge. And the picture from below, from above, when Dark Knight is below, closer to the atmosphere, and it's taken from the outside, it's obviously very, very large, but there was that was put out by NASA a couple of years ago. I think that Dark Knight, what what was discovered in 1930, and then what was again revealed uh, in 1950, 19, or I'm sorry, 1958, I believe, um, means uh, Dark Knight is real, and that is my opinion. Okay, so moving on, let's let's bang through these emails. Uh, Marshall Clarfield, Jimmy. As much as I appreciate the life work of Marshall Clarfield, it seems that his close-mindedness to the experiences and revelations of his channeling friend is no different. Well, I think he was talking about his daughter. Is no different from his own colleague's skepticism of him and his discoveries and theories, doesn't it? Yes, and and you know what? We address that directly. Uh, that's from Renee. We address that directly. He's a tire kicker. And Marshall and I were talking about this earlier today before he came on the show. And that is, you know, he says the word, you know, 3D. He's a 3D guy. He's more of a like a 2D guy. He's a black and white guy. He's a he's an engineer and he looks at things logically when I asked him. And so he just wants evidence. And that's the difference with anybody that is channeling. Then you're opening yourself up to opinion. There's no proof. Okay, that's it. It's just somebody's beliefs and opinions. There's no proof that anybody is channeling. And even though that the person that he was talking about, Renee, was his daughter, and he said his daughter is entitled to her opinions, but he's a tire kicker. He is a guy that needs to have proof. The proof has got to be there in front of him. So when he's talking about the Anunnaki, he's talking about the the clay tablets, the cuneiform tablets that are there that you can reach out, touch cuneiform tablets that you can reach out, touch, see they're in museums. You can fondle them. You can research, you can do everything. So that for him is, is where the, the proof lies and all of his research is based on that. I asked him today, you know, it's, it's Zachariah, Zachariah Sitchin's, uh, interpretations and translations of those tablets that you're depending on. I didn't go to, so um, that that's where that comes from, Renee. I didn't go uh, too hard into one of the things that um, that is out there. There is, without naming names, there's a lot of debunkers out there when it comes to Sitchin, a lot. And uh, one of them, uh, a lot of the points that they make are his translations and references to specific subjects. I 
I can't read it. I can't decode it. I can't translate it. So I'm not one of those people that I have to depend on everybody else. So when you have researchers and debunkers on one side and researchers and and disciples on the other side, they're going, going to interpret the way that they're going to interpret. You know, and when it comes down to black and white, I don't know. I don't know who to believe. And it seems like everybody really it really wants to bring down the other. You know, so I, I, I don't know. I really don't. When it comes to Sitchin, I'm still on the fence. And I asked Marshall today. I said, look, you know, you have to understand I'm I'm fascinated with the subject. I'm fascinated with Planet X and Nibiru and the Anunnaki and the fact that the Sumerians were able to have all of these sudden discoveries pop up in the middle of the desert all at once. I'm pretty fascinated by that too, but I have questions. And he said, Jimmy, just bring it. Just bring it. I'm I'm used to it. I'm old. I've done this before. Okay. Uh, another email just come in. Have you considered trying to coordinate your Anunnaki information with what is revealed in the, oh, in the Urantia revelation to fill in some missing gaps? Would you like to work on a project like that? You know what? That's a great question, not only for me, but for Marshall. I will forward that to him. And when I get the results back, I will read that back. All right. And let's see. I think that about wraps it up. Again, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, Dan Fogler with uh, Don Peyote. And and for <laughs> for everybody out there, go check out Dan's work. Go check out the trailer for Don Peyote. And don't get it confused with Don Peyote, the, the composer, the musician guy out there. No, go to IMDb and uh, and check out the trailers. And, and so you know exactly what is going on with that tomorrow night. Uh, Friday night, Brad Olson will be in here. Uh, next week, I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit. We're going to have Jim Mars in here on Wednesday. That's going to be fantastic. And next Friday, Michael Tellinger. And uh, so, yeah, really good stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks. And let's bounce back to Twitter. Oh, man, it just won't stop, will it? It was allegedly discovered before that by Tesla around 1908. I don't know what you're talking about. Whitley should be awesome. Yes, he will be. Please mention the show replay schedule at the end of the program. Ah, I think the replay schedule is this show happens at between 2 and 3 a.m. And then I, I, I think, you know what, Keith, if you're listening... Somebody had mentioned this also uh, earlier this week to have to post the replay schedule somewhere. Just post it up. What what is going on, and is it consistent every single day? I don't know because I don't go and listen to it. Um, I'm working on this show the next day, so I don't know what the replay schedule is. So Keith, if we can get that up, I have no problem with not only posting it on our website, but uh, maybe we can get that up over on Dark Matter. All right, and let's see how many minutes. What's the countdown? All shows. This is Keith. He just said all shows replay over again, one after the other. So I guess what he's saying is in the order that they play live is the order that they replay right after another. Is that what you're saying, Keith? And I'm sure Keith is about to type yes. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. Oh, man, what a great show tonight. Again, thank you to Marshall, Marshall Clarfield. That was amazing. And uh, tomorrow night, don't forget, Dan Fogler will be in here tomorrow. And that's it. I want to thank everybody. It was a great night tonight. And and having Marshall hang in. And the big news that we're going to cover tomorrow is uh, that underground entrance at Malibu. And we will get that posted up on the website tomorrow. We'll write the article. We'll get the release going. But uh, that's potentially some pretty explosive stuff. Stay tuned. Coming up next, Night Watch with your host, Todd Sheets, with four co-hosts and six guests and a couple of, uh, couple of llamas. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kumarian. 
show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark D. Kovar. The announcers are Steve Harder and Mark D. Kovar. Music is this guy. That's right, Doug Aldrich. The show intro performed tonight by Space Boy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll see you tomorrow night, everybody. Be safe. See ya. Yeah.